Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another thrill-packed episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. I, of course, am the aforementioned Jim Cornette, and joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's the longest-tenured co-host in professional wrestling, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, I think. Where was the preamble? Usually there's a long preamble there. I don't, I'm, just help me open my eyes. Can you email me over some adrenaline? I'm a little droopy today. Doesn't matter, you wouldn't be able to open it. Well, that's true. You know, I'm having problems with the email. Don't get me fucking started. I just found out about this email issue that I, I don't read them to begin with anyway, most of the time. And then when I try to read them or send them, something's happening. This is a different issue besides the issue that you pointed out to me. Microsoft sent some of my shit back for some reason. Apparently, I didn't dot all my T's and cross my I's or something. My eyes are crossed. What day is this? <laughs> what time is this? What? Where are? Is this real life? My uh, or just fantasy? Normally, or is it just a fantasy? Aldo Nova, you fucking prick. Um, why did he never follow that up with another hit? Life is just a fantasy. Can you live this fantasy life? I was actually going for Queen, but I think Aldo Nova would have followed it up with a hit if he could have found another hit. Well, who was hiding them from him? Check out and look up. If hits were easy to come by, Chris Jericho would be at the Grammys. I mean, come on. No, that's that's more of the blind squirrel finding a nut sooner or later fucking category. But anyway, the point I was trying to make is Our recording schedule has been all over the place the last few weeks because of the renovations, remodeling, work at the castle here. I got my windows, got my windows in, have to wait for the doors, but I've got windows. I got windows and a wall now. And boy, you ought to see that window procedure. They are just, the, the fine folks at Renewals by Anderson, best window company in the world, they custom make these bad boys. Got uh, about 18 of them. They ain't cheap, but they'll last for they'll last longer than I I will. So many years from now, people are going to be looking out my windows. I got to do something about that. Have you ever thought about the fact that you're putting all this money into Castle Cornet? It's a beautiful place already, and you're making it more and more beautiful, more and more sustainable, more and more preserving it for the future. What about turning the whole thing into a giant mausoleum after you pass? Well, that's what's going to, it's going to be, I'm I'm being buried here in it. They're going to just, in it, they're going to put me in the middle of the house and just pour some concrete over the top of it. And it'll be like a modern day pyramid to King Tudon Corny. Oh, there you go, Travis. (laughs) There you you go. (laughs) Thought he was a monkey, funky tut. Did you see it in his jammies? What? I don't know if we talked about it. I can't remember. But a little while back, there was a thing on Twitter where younger people, mostly, primarily, were complaining about Steve Martin. Not complaining, but just saying, how is this guy ever considered funny? And they were using that as the example, the King Tut video. It was fucking hilarious. Completely out of context of the time and place and everything else. Yes. Because King Tut was in the news. What did Tut do then that got in the news in, what, 1977, 78? He went on tour. He went on tour. That's right. The Stones promoter booked him, I think. Sent him on a big fucking worldwide tour. And and that was a hit song. That song was actually, <laughs> that song fucking charted, I think, higher than whatever the Rolling Stones did that year. Fucking complaining about Steve Martin. You know, you should have just stopped with some younger people were complaining. Because they do that without any point of reference. See, I've lived 60 years. I've seen the good shit and the bad shit, so I know what to complain about. These people, they got no experience, Brian. They got no life experience. And they just, they don't know what to complain about. There's bigger things than Steve Martin to complain about in the world today. I'll tell you. But the weather, we could complain about that. Thank you, everybody who tweeted and asked, and uh, they didn't call. 
I would have frowned upon that, about whether we're okay here with the bad weather in Kentucky. Let me explain this fucking geographical meteorological fiasco to everybody. So as of a week ago, this part of Kentucky, Louisville and the surrounding area, was anything from abnormally dry to moderate drought condition. And it wasn't just here, it was other places in, in the area as well. But then over the past week, we've had a few different days where it rained, 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 you know, not horribly. It wasn't the worst downpour I've ever seen, but we, we got probably a total of three inches of rain over several days here in the Louisville area, depending on where you were. And now we're still a couple inches behind in rain for the year, but it helped the drought that we had and blah, blah, blah. 120 miles as the as the unicorn flies across the man over in eastern Kentucky. Hazard, Kentucky got eight inches of rain in 12 hours, which is I mean, somebody, people uh, saw St. Louis in the news. They got like 10 inches of rain in the same period of time. And St. Louis was fucked up for a while. But Eastern Kentucky, for anybody around the world and anybody even in the United States that has never been there, that part of Kentucky and, and the adjoining part of West Virginia, there's no flat space. The only large flat areas are man-made where it's been developed over recent years and and they've chopped the top off a fucking mountain that's what they did in charleston west virginia to make an airport they had to chop the top off a mountain so down there when they get heavy rain like that and there's creeks and there's a river or two down there anyway all the water floods from obviously water runs downhill, Brian. You've heard this. This was in some of the science books. Water runs downhill. I've even seen it. Yeah. Yeah. You you can watch it sometimes if you catch it in the wild. Well, it's mountains, and all the towns are in in between the mountains because that's the flattest space. You can't put a town on the side of a fucking mountain. They're in the hollows. The hollers. And so the water runs down and these creeks overflow and the water comes into town and it's chaos. And there's a number of fatalities, but that's what happened in Eastern. We had weeks of drought and 100 degree temperatures that's completely unseasonable. And that turned into deluges of rain in some parts in, in just the same day and massive floods. But don't worry, it's going to stop raining, and it's going to go back to being a hundred and something degrees heat index within the next few days. So we're 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 okay up here. Eastern Kentucky's not in real good shape, and we hope that everybody who comes out through that well. And speaking of somebody that didn't come through something well, did you hear about Tony Dow? I did hear about Tony Dow. We just talked about him on the drive-through. Well, Breaking yes, news. and we we killed the man. He wasn't dead. We pronounced him dead when he wasn't dead. Did you hear? You heard about that, right? We reported. Reported. We read we a report. Reported. We had people on the scene. Well, no. Chad Huntley and David Brinkley. According to the article, it was his wife, I believe, who yes. told everyone that he was dead. Maybe she was just being the queen of wishful thinking. I don't, but no, apparently we pronounced, and by the way, he is now dead, but we pronounced Tony Dow dead based on the news report that we received from the Google machine where apparently someone misinterpreted something that his wife said. He was in ill health and was in hospice care at home, but he was in the house. You would think his wife would, would have the update, but she said something, somebody misinterpreted it. And everybody announced he was dead, and then they had to come back several hours later after we had finished our recording and said, no, no, he's still alive. And then, son of a bitch, the next day, wouldn't you know what happened, he died. But now I'm sure that there's probably people going, no, nah, fuck you. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I'm not believing Tony Dow, but apparently Tony Dow is deceased. And Generalissimo Francisco Franco is still dead. And Generalissimo. Vincento McMahon is still retired. So we just have those updates. I know a lot of people were asking about poor Tony's condition. 
Were you the one of the ones that were asking about Tony Dow's condition? Well, I felt bad as soon as we were done recording is when I saw the thing on Twitter that he's not dead, he's alive. And then I said, oh, shit. You know, we just recorded the show. You apparently didn't feel bad enough to call me back and say, hey, we got to do an update. We got to rescind this. Well, unfortunately, by the time the show came out, he was officially pronounced dead. So we were technically correct, just not when when we said it. All right. Well, we got that out of the way. Uh, by I send the way, my sympathies to the beaver. The, the beaver's the only one left. He's the only one that someone sent us an article that Lumpy died in 2013. Frank Bank was the actor's <laughs> That's right. name. Great name. Lumpy Rutherford. I'm surprised he didn't move right into major motion pictures. I like Lumpy's dad. Whenever you saw him on a show. Richard Deacon. Yeah. He was more famous for being Mel Cooley on the Dick Van Dyke show, but he was he was a fine character. I actor. like him as Lumpy's dad. Well, a poor old... I like Leave it to Beaver better than the Dick Van Dyke show. What? I absolutely now, do. I minute. think it's a Hold better on. show. No, it's a no, better no, show. It oh, holds no. up. <sighs> it's the single greatest family-based sitcom because it's not dumb. It, it's not dumbed down. The beaver gets into all this fucking mischief. His brother's a reasonable brother. Eddie's a prick. But we all know Eddie's growing up. Lumpy, we've all known Lumpy's growing up. Too. Now, Usually they're hanging out with Eddie. Lumpy's? Yeah. But are you just saying that for clicks? Are you just saying very that serious. to troll people, to create controversy for cash? Leave it to Beaver better than the Dick Van Dyke. Show. I enjoy it better, and I like Dick Van Dyke just fine, but I think it's a better show. Let me ask you this. Is Hugh Beaumont not the greatest TV dad of all time? Well, what about Rob Petrie? Exactly. Is Hugh Beaumont not the greatest TV dad uh, of all time? Or all Rob had a kid. Richie made it into the living room when they were doing the dance routines and the comedy sketches every once in a while in his pajamas. Is Barbara Billingsley... Billingsley, I can't even say Billy. Is Barbara <laughs> Billingsley not the epitome of a TV mom? What about Laura Petrie? Boy, wouldn't you have liked to have had her for a MILF or a mom <laughs> or something of that nature? <laughs> Make your See, mind that, up. <laughs> it's, it's a family. It's a family <laughs> unit. But there was, there was Maury Amsterdam and Rosemary. Come on. Are you seriously going to tell me that Maury Amsterdam is not a better supporting player than Frank Bank? Is there a single moment of the Dick Van Dyke show as good as Beaver and the Giant Soup? Yes. Yes, there is. There is the Walnut episode where Danny Thomas appears as... Oh, give me a break. ...the alien from Twilo. You Beaumont's better than Danny Thomas as a dad on TV? Eddie Haskell <sighs> is a better character, and it holds up. Go back and watch Ken Osmond. It's amazing how young this guy was. He was perfect. It holds up today. Eddie Haskell's a better character than any show had. Well, you've got, actually, I will agree with you there. Eddie Haskell's roots can be seen today in television programs like AEW. Whiny little fucking crooked little fucking teenage pricks causing trouble for other people. It wasn't the direction I thought you were going to go in there. <laughs> anyway, uh, more news. I've got, I've got notes here. There's more news. Do you... <laughs> Stunning Steve's Raccoon Removal LLC. I, I haven't checked or didn't check my emails for like a week because people were pounding on my walls and things. And I checked and he'd been keeping me updated and I hadn't had a chance to talk to him. Guess the number of raccoons that we, that we, I say we, that Stunning Steve has trapped and removed from the property. Six. Ten. Ten cents. Ten since the start of the thing. Since the start of the thing, okay. Ten, ra and the giant mutant raccoon that's almost as big as the trap still is, has learned and is too smart. I'm telling you, they're getting intelligence. The raccoons, they're going to be speaking any time. As soon as this fucking giant raccoon says, no, I'm fucking leaving. But the raccoon is too smart. It's learned it will not go in and eat the bait in the appropriate part of the cage to trip the door to, to close it in. So it's still on the loose here in the community. And in completely, what I'm sure is completely unrelated news, there's been a series of 
Small children down at the park several miles away attacked by rabid raccoons, but I'm sure that has nothing to do with what's going on over here. So that I got an email from, uh, this is a testimonial, a customer testimonial. Where is it? It's gone away. There it is. A customer testimonial for the fine service that is created at jimcornett.com at Cornette's Collectibles now that the feather bottoms, Hotchkiss, Fanny, and Felcher have taken over the shipping. And of course, I've talked about the the Feather Bottoms Ultra Careful Handling System, the fuck system. And I've gotten an email from Adam up in Edmonton, Calgary, Alberta. Or no, I guess it's not Edmonton, Calgary, Alberta. It's just Edmonton, Alberta. And that would be great if it was Edmonton, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Would you like to hear Adam's email? Yeah, if you could ever get back in the country, that's a great line you could use to get some heat. There you go. Dear Jim parenthetically, and Brian. I wanted to express to Jim how greatly appreciative I am of how my fiancé has been fucked by your wonderful staff, the Featherbottoms, recently. My fiancé knows what a big fan I am of your fine programs, and she decided for our upcoming wedding on August 5th, congratulations, Adam and fiancé. He didn't even mention your name, so that's how important you are. But anyway, our upcoming wedding on August 5th, to get me a little wedding present from Cornette's Collectibles in the form of an autographed photo with an an inspirational quote related to head holders and dog fuckers, I remember signing that, and the ever-popular Thank You, Fuck You, Buy t-shirt. Apparently, the entire process of getting fucked by the feather bottoms took less than two weeks. When I was given the parcel early yesterday, I noticed it was still in perfect condition and it had been packaged only nine days previously. Nine days to get fucked in Canada. My fiancé said she's never been fucked so expertly and effectively as by your dedicated staff. Jim, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the wonderful autographed photo and T-shirt, and thank you so much for making sure my future wife got fucked so well. Sincerely, good health and safety, Adam in Edmonton, near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thank you, Adam. An unsolicited testimonial as to the amazing service at Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com provided by the Feather Bottoms and the Feather Bottom Ultra Careful Handling System. So if you want to get fucked, order from jimcornette.com. And I will mention the... Commentator play sets are still available besides the ones that had an accident last weekend with the baseball bat when Spectrum, more on them later, fucked me around on the pay-per-view, and also the the behind-the-curtain graphic novels, and I'll have you know that right now, by the time you hear the sound of my voice, we have found about three dozen unsold Outlaw Mud Show t-shirts that were discontinued, what was it, early last year or whatever, and those are more applicable and needed apparently than ever before but there's only a handful of each size we're not restocking them this is again with the beautiful inventory feature on the website we're clearing out some space so that i have more storage area so and they're on clearance since they are a discontinued item any size small to 5x while they last and that won't be long 20 dollars each plus five dollars shipping the Outlaw Mud Show t-shirts while they last. Now that I've said that, if you don't go to jimcornett.com in the next 17 seconds, you're probably not going to get anything but a small. But that's that. And I'll have you know that I almost fulfilled my prophecy, Brian, and I got all but 15 packages to the Feather Bottoms from the figure sale a couple of weeks ago. So that will be, uh, by the time the folks hear this, all those things will be in the mail and the last 15 are being picked up in a day or two to head out that way as well. And we're all caught up and no waiting at jimcornett.com. Isn't that exciting? Are you asleep? Kind of. Is what exciting? Getting fucked by the feather bottoms? Isn't it exciting that the feather bottoms are fucking people, not only in the United States, but all over the world so well? Speaking of getting <laughs> fucked, I've talked about the uh, the people at Spectrum 
and how incompetent they are and how they don't know how their own equipment works and how they'll steal your money and cheat you. They will make you pay more than you should. They'll give you less than they offer that they're supposed to give you. But apparently I'm not the person who's had the worst experience with Spectrum and their affiliated cable and satellite and phone and whatever they do to fuck people's lives up. Because a bunch of people have sent me this. They have been ordered to pay. I believe I saw billions of dollars to the family of a woman that one of their employees who went to this poor old woman's house to service her equipment or whatever, scoped the place out, came back the next day and robbed and murdered her. And apparently this has gone through the legal system and spectrum or what is their parent okay i saw charter also they apparently they changed their names to stay ahead of the law in certain geographical regions well these fucking crooks now are on the hook so that means they're going to be gouging our prices even more now and giving us less service to pay for this but apparently they're not satisfied with just being a shitty internet service with people that don't know how their own equipment works so they can fix it when their other incompetent service people screw it up and they'll take your money, but they'll also come back and murder you in your own home hours or days later. So that settles the issue of why I'm not going to have any more of these repugnant fucking reprobates out here in my, in my home. I'll just send them their monthly graft payment or maybe they're running a protection racket. Here, you're only giving me half of what I'm supposed to get, and you're charging me twice as much as you should be, but I'll just send you that check so that I don't you don't send your people over here to murder me in my sleep. Last time on the show, you... I thought about editing it off the show. You talked about how the next time Spectrum comes in your house, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. I believe I said grab them around the neck and squeeze their britches full and make their voices sound like Peter Frampton's electronic kazoo solo and do you feel like we do? That was it. Yes, I remember. physical felonious assault. The Frampton reference made me remember because, again, the last time we had talked about him was a keep spot. But I thought that was too far. And then I realized after this story, if you didn't get him, he would have got you. So, I mean, it's you self-defense. <laughs> It's fucking A. You know, maybe that's the thing. I can get even with these some bitches. I can call one to come over here once he's in here. Fucking Katie bar the door and I can plead self-defense. There's precedent. <sighs> anyway, also, real, real quickly, got an email from Jeremy in Dayton, Ohio. The subject of the email was, Attaboy, corny! And Jeremy says, greetings and salutations, Mr. Cornette. I'm writing in regards to a couple of subjects. After hearing you talk about the ghost and Mr. Chicken countless times, I made sure to tune into Svengoolie to see what the hype was all about. I did thoroughly enjoy the film, but the best part was watching my handsome puppy Luther lose his mind every time anyone said his name. Secondly, I was wondering if Luther could get a shout out for his second birthday on August 4th, I'm attaching a picture of my baby boy. He's an 80-pound American bulldog and great Pyrenees mix. I've never even heard of a Pyrenees. He was a, a cute little, well, I won't say little. He's a cute puppy. I don't know about baby or little. 80 pounds already. Got big paws. It was, it was a cute picture. You ought to seen it, Brian. He was, he actually, he almost dressed like you. He, he looked like quite me. a bit like you. Yeah. In what way? Well, just, you know, the cute little collar he had on and the fucking tags and everything like you wear. Anyway, so Jeremy, we happy birthday to Luther. <laughs> At a point. <laughs> the tags. <laughs> Stop right. it. I'm Stop. Moondog last, ladies and gentlemen. Stop it. Oh, God damn it. Uh, what else we got here? Um, oh, also, you know what I was doing? I, I jotted this down last night because I was straightening up the office. And there's nothing ever on TV anymore. It wasn't time for real time. Bill Maher's back, so at least we got that going for us. But it wasn't time. It wasn't the, the time for that. And I said, you know what? 
I'm going to pop in one of my state-of-the-art DVDs, a little, a little clean in the office music. And you know what I put in? I put in one of my 12-volume set of Burt Sugarman's Midnight Special performances. Did you, this was a TV offer that Stacy got for me about seven or eight years ago, I guess it was. You prefer have you the, seen these? I have seen some of them. I don't have the whole set. I wish I did. Do you prefer the Midnight Special over rock concert? Well, now it depends. See, it's never just that easy, Brian, to just answer a question like that because Don Kirshner's rock concert was exceptional for its time. And of course, for the for the younger folks, before MTV, you never got to see what the artists playing your favorite music looked like. Because they were, especially if it was the the uh, the young rock groups weren't, sometimes welcomed on mainstream television back in those days. You got to go to the Ed Sullivan show. He was before his time. He was actually before and after his time. And the world was better for it. There are so many ugly people that made great music that would never get a chance today. Well, but you wanted to see what they looked like, right? You know, so you got to see either Don Kirster's rock concert, which was that, but they were both, no, they were, Kirster's rock concert was syndicated, Right. And then Burt Sugarman's Midnight Special, that was NBC. And for a while, ABC had in concert. The point is they were all trying to get this revolutionary new segment of society called teenagers and rock and roll fans that TV had ignored. And the Midnight Special was, was great when they started, but then, as you see in the DVD set toward the end of the 70s, there started being more lip syncing and started being more videos played. And then it's just the same thing. You know, in the early years, especially unless the artist just didn't want to do it, apparently, or it couldn't be replicated on stage, the, the performances were live. And that was even wilder because you never got to see that. So in concert had its moments where it was better than the Midnight Special, but the Midnight Special, especially early on, I think was better because let's face it. Wolfman Jack was more fun to watch than Don Kirshner. Well. Don Kirshner was no <laughs> Dick Clark, but he couldn't, he couldn't keep himself off his programs. Maybe that's why the monkeys didn't like him. But anyway, I put this DVD at, you know, my favorite one, 1973, that golden year, Brian, listen to the live performances from just that year alone that were on the midnight special. What year did the show come on? Because that must have been early on in its run, 73. I, th I think this is the first year. Yeah, okay. Because that uh, 73 was the bad thing. That was uh, maybe maybe uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert came along in 72. And I think In Concert came along as an answer to the Midnight Special. So 72, 73 was the big change. But these performances, do you know what I consider the best female vocal performance of the 1970s from 73 from 1973 Gladys Knight new no. I get completely lost yeah I don't know who else. Uh, what what woman singer did you really I, I don't even know why I put it that way what female vocalist what woman singer because you hate women that's women why I put it singers. that way <laughs> them damn women they're singing again Linda Ronstadt, long, long time, live version on the Midnight Special. It's just her out there with the microphone. The band in the background is subdued. It's a slow song. No fancy instrumental tra it tricks or tracks. It's all about Linda Ronstadt and her voice, the plaintiveness of it, the sadness, the emotion. She knocked that one out of the park. I dare you go back and just watch this woman emit her art and tell me that's not the greatest vocal performance of the 70s. Yeah, you just love that whole scene, the Eagles and the Ronstadt. Oh, come on, but it's talent. It's talent. Love will abide. Take things in stride. You You're not going to... What? You're not. You're not even going to say that 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 those amazing lyricisms of the early singer songwriter years are not uh, not art. I'm not saying. Of course, they're art. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just 
Some of them I may not want to listen to. Some of them may be a fart instead of art. Have you ever seen the old gray whistle test out of England? That's my favorite. I have all those DVDs because those are the best film performances and the single best performances because there's no audience usually. It's just the artist in the studio with the camera. But but the audience whispering is Bob the, Harris. The, the audio, I agree. The live performances on the old gray whistle test are uh, quality. But you got to oh, have yeah. the audience to give some feedback there, even in a studio. Just a little. It's like doing angles in front of an empty building. You know what else was in 1973? Billy Preston. Will it go around in circles? Live performance on the midnight special. Now 73. Trying to think what year the Stones toured. Because remember, he was a part of the Stones touring band for a few years. He played on yes. a few of the albums, too. I think 73 might have been one of the years. And as a matter of Go fact... Go Ted Soup, uh, right? Uh, it, yes, as a matter of fact. And he, but he stopped by the Midnight Special. Because he had a story that ain't got no morals. And he let the bad guy win every once in a while. Can you imagine... You got, you, go ahead. I'm just saying, can you imagine being like a young musician, playing with other young musicians... And then a few years later, they have the Beatles. And they're like, oh, shit, you're in town. Come by the studio. Play with us, the Beatles. That's amazing. It's amazing what happened to Billy Preston. The and then he, he, he actually played in Get Back in Sgt. Pepper. He was the, the, the bugler, remember? That's the worst movie. Why would you even? Did you see that movie, that whole thing? Oh, yes. Through? But it was, it was great for Earth, Wind, and Fire. And... <laughs> That's that. And it was awful fact, for way, everything else. The Bee Gees. For everything and, else, oh. yeah. It killed everybody else's career, but Earth, Wind, and Fire came out sliggered and come on a gold tooth. And that that soundtrack, it was a double album. And that soundtrack album got more public following up Saturday Night Fever. They thought they had another one. Robert Stigwood and the whole nine yards. They thought, okay, this is the Golden Goose. And the publicity for that album was incredible. It's the only album in music history that shipped double platinum and returned triple platinum. Did you ever see the movie that Stigwood produced after that, Times Square? No. That is actually a movie I love, even though the finished version is not what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be like some teenage lesbian story in Times Square in the 70s. Instead... It ends up being about a politician's daughter who runs away and meets this teenage runaway and they form a punk band. And this is in Manhattan and it's all filmed on the streets of Times Square in the late 70s. It looks incredible. And Tim Curry, my favorite Tim Curry role ever. It sounds weird saying that. Johnny LaGuardia, the DJ, (laughs) who plays that. And he's just so good in this fucking role. And it has the greatest soundtrack. It's a double album and it has all the punk and... I guess I'll say New Wave, punk and New Wave songs from that era. And the movie just bombed. And the soundtrack's kind of a little bit of a collectible now, but I like the movie, and I think it's a beautiful-looking movie, and it's a great capture of Times Square and New York City at that moment, but the soundtrack's awesome. And you just love the punk music. You love the anti-establishment crowd. Okay, I do. back Back to the Midnight Special, then. If you like the punk music, Live, 10-minute version, Mark Bolin and T-Rex bang a gong. Live. 10 minutes. T- it's at least 10 minutes. He does two different solos. He goes through the whole guy. He changes instruments, and he's got the two rowdiest black female backup singers that were ever allowed to appear on network television just shaking and quivering everywhere. That was his only hit in the States, but he had a bunch of hits in England, and he had some great albums and great songs. Do you know any of his material beyond Bang a Gong? Uh, a bit of it because, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but Adrian Street was always some very reliable with his stories, and he said that his stylings, style, whatever, uh, the exotic Adrian Street influenced Mark Bolin. That's what he always told me. The early glam rock. Do you like Slade? Run, run, run away. Goodbye to Jane. Where did when did where did Jane go? Well, it's in the song "Goodbye to Jane." They did the original version of um, "Come on, Feel the Noise." That's right. And then uh, who was Quiet Riot? Re, uh, remade that or right. covered that. And it, but yes, yeah, Slade was the original. Come and they even they even spelled it 
awkwardly as well, didn't they? Or did they? Or did Quiet Riot start that? No, uh, Slade started that. St- Slade started that. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Mr. Music, and we'll finish up Midnight Special. Another live version, extended version, on stage, Edgar Winter Group Frankenstein. Why did they name the song Frankenstein that I used for the Heavenly Bodies as a follow-up after we used uh, Giorgio Moroder for oh. the Midnight Express? Why did they call it Frankenstein? It's a very good question. Uh, the Edgar Winter Group, a great group, by the way, one night they all went out partying, and the next morning they woke up and they were foggy-eyed and... In the blur of the haze of the room, someone saw Rick Derringer naked, and they thought it was Frankenstein. But only because they were laying down, because he's five foot two. Okay, that's good off the top of your head, but it's complete <laughs> bullshit. It is, but good off the top of my yeah, head. Yeah, but it was good off the top of your head. <laughs> that song was pieced together by from literally pieces of tape from various things they had done in the studio, which is why that it sounds like it's two or three different songs put together, but in the masterful way that it's done with a variety of instruments, it was pieced together from remnants of riffs and uh, things they had recorded and they put it all together and made it flow. And to show how good Edgar Winter was, in the live version on stage, he plays every goddamn instrument. He plays the keyboard, he plays the drums, he plays the he plays the whole nine yards. They keep handing him shit. He goes from one to another and does that whole song live on stage, including the feedback in the middle. And I think, is that at the end, is that where he sets the goddamn amplifiers on fire? Possibly. But it was uh, it was over the top for network TV at the time. 73, you got Jim Croce? Jim Croce? Right before he uh, died. Yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, I'm trying to think, wait a minute, we had two Jim Croce. There was two clips, and I'm trying to think which one was on the 73. It was probably Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, and uh, Operator was one of his songs that he was playing a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bad, Bad Leroy Brown was on that, and Operator was a clip. I think Operator, did Operator not come out after he was already dead? As a single, I don't know. As a single, I'm not yeah. sure. Well, no, I didn't. No, they didn't. He did. They didn't make the song after he was dead. They released the single after he was dead. Hey, you could do. A It'd lot be of awful things. hard for him to sing that whole song with him being dead. He's a talented guy. Well, I know, but you, you know, you can't have expectations too high. And speaking hey, of whoa, high whoa, expectations, whoa, one more, one more, oh, one more. This may get you some heat with someone. Who knows? Do you like Steely Dan? Yes. Yes, I do. They were very technically proficient. Two uglier human beings you couldn't find. But they were very technically proficient. And they were reeling in the years on this this highlight also. And you're right. They are really ugly, and they found the ugliest friends they could to fill the band up with. Yeah. And that's a point. They never would have gotten a shot today. But back then, you heard them before you ever saw them. Long you before know, you know that's ever saw that's them. true. When you would hear a Steely Dan album, Pretzel Logic or Ricky, don't lose that number. You think these are young Frank Sinatra's? They got to be some swinging hip cats that are cool and they got all the chicks hanging off and the whole. And then you see them in two bigger fucking <laughs> college nerds you would never see in your life. They they if they were. That age today, I'm sure they'd be AEW fans. Who was the original drummer for what would become Steely Dan? Oh, God damn it. It wasn't I, called Steely Dan yet, but it was Fagan and uh, what's his name? Walter Becker. The dead one, but, yeah. uh, but But that's not the drummer. That's the, Becker and Fagan right. were basically the, the group. Uh, the drummer, uh, I'm lost. Chevy Chase. What? That's true. I have never heard this before. Are you, did you hear this from Hulk Hogan? I heard this from Chevy Chase. No, I, this is, oh. I think, a known thing. It's out there. I'm going to just throw it it's out there now and let the thing. listeners get back to you with some Chevy Chase and Steely Dan notes. Well, if anybody does have any light to shed on this, please please pop in and let us know if Chevy Chase, or maybe you're getting them confused, and Chevy Chase was going to play for Metallica, and it was Hulk Hogan that was going to... Oh. It was Steely Dan. Steely Dan had a show in Chevy Chase, Maryland. That's what I'm getting confused with. That's what it was. Um, All right, I got an update. I promised an update last week on Norman Dooley. And here is the Norman Weasel Dooley update. We have spoken twice now. 
for the first and second time in 25 years. And I want to, th- as I said last week, I want to thank all the amateur detectives out there, specifically John Fell, who scared the shit out of me with the uh, amount of information he was able to compile on a random United States citizen. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what's going on with John. Is <laughs> might have one of those fucking meet the Fockers fucking control centers in his house up there. He's he's tied up with or tied into some tied things. Up? Maybe tied up or tied in with <laughs> Anyway, but I found Norman Dooley, and we've talked a couple of times and trying to catch up, and we're going to have more on that and more Weasel's World uh, newsletter reading in the shows in the weeks to come. But as a as an overall update for the fans to uh, and the listeners to figure out what happened, basically, um. It was right after, I didn't see Norman last in 95, it was in 96 at a WWF show in Louisville at the Gardens, the infamous one where all the talent was driving in from Indianapolis and got there late, and and me and PJ Walker, uh, Aldo Montoya, and Duke the Dumpster Drossy had to, and Vader, who finally got in, had to kill the first fucking hour and a half of the show. And we had talked there, and then about that time, without getting into, you know, Norman's personal business, but he did uh, start having some health issues that started uh, innocently enough and then got more complicated. And by the time that he dealt with that, uh, that was the point in time where his parents, who I was incorrect, and I apologize that Norman's father had not passed away. His mom and dad were divorced. That's why he was his father was not usually around the house, but his father used to take him to a lot of matches, and I should have remembered that. Uh, just I didn't ride with him. But, but anyway, uh, after Norman's health issues, which lasted a number of years, it went straight into the time where his parents' both health were fading because they were in their 90s at that point, and he was kind of... At the same time, uh, the Memphis Territory had gone under uh, in 97 here in Louisville. There was not a lot of live wrestling to go to until Danny Davis really got started. And by that point, you know, Norman was distracted. So that was about a 15-year period that he got out of, uh, you know, going to shows and or, you know, the pen pal thing. And then as we were talking about, you know, a lot of our old pen pals were older than us. Uh, Brian, you mentioned this, that Norman and myself and a few of the other guys that we talked about were kind of the younger generation of the smart fan at that point. And as I've been talking to Norman, we realized that most of the people that he used to write to or have passed on. And uh, so at any rate, uh, you know, that was the thing after after Norman, you know, got through that situation and and his parents had passed away um he was just uh he was out of the the habit and out of the picture and everybody that didn't hear from him thought that he was gone somehow either geographically or physically but anyway i wanted to say please let's respect his privacy now because his phone hadn't rung like this in 30 years uh but uh he's got you know i've enjoyed and we're gonna have some more conversations he's gonna remind me of some more things he's got an amazing memory as Lawler said one time, he reminds elephants of what they forgot. So that's the Norman Dooley update. And thank everybody for their help in uh, in getting us back together. And we appreciate everyone's help. And with that said, John Fell, stop blocking the man's driveway. Go home. Hey, you know, yeah, John, you can call off the dogs now. And please, for heaven's sake, let his let his pet back in the house, too. Um what else have we got going on this week in pro wrestling? Let's see. I thought I had another. Oh, this is something here. Uh, Brian, we asked the question. I can't remember how we phrased the question, but we were talking about the ridiculous number of championships and titles and things that are being belts, things that are being defended in AEW or competed for or talked about on AEW television. Would you like to hear the complete list that Jordan in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, a lot of people up there in Alberta listening, he compiled this for us so we could go up and down this list. 
I'll go. Uh, I'll go down it. You go back up. It. Now they okay. just, for the record, they just announced three new titles or one new championship. I guess I should say this past week on Dynamite. So this is up to date. This list. Um. Yeah. This that their new title is at number five here. So this is up to date. Okay. This is as of yesterday. Jordan, again from Calgary, says, These are all the belts that have been shown on AEW television and or competed for on AEW television. The AEW World title, the TNT title, the AEW All-Atlantic title, the AEW Tag title, the AEW Trios title, the AEW Women's title, the AEW TBS title, the Owen Hart men's title, the Owen Hart women's title, the FTW title, the Impact world title, the Impact tag team titles, the ROH world title, the ROH pure title, the ROH tag titles, the ROH women's title, the AAA tag titles, the IWGP Jesus. United States title. Now, here's an asterisk. These titles were on the Forbidden Door pay-per-view. IWGP world title. IWGP tag title. Two asterisks. The annual Dynamite Diamond Ring. <laughs> oh, I guess so. Yeah, you would include that. That would bring the total to 20. 20 different championships of some description that are won in some fashion have been shown or competed for on AEW title. But Jordan, he sums the whole thing up. He says, so I wholeheartedly resent and dispute the notion that everyone in AEW has a title. There are at least four people who do not. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. Even if you take out all the ones that are and I'm not justifying this, temporary titles, like the IWGP showed up for the Forbidden Door or whatever. Even if you take all those outside ones out, there's still so many AEW ones, and when so many people are carrying belts, the belts mean less. Well, exactly, because, again, we know that there is a certain segment of the population that's going to sit there and take note of every happening and keep track of who's the champion and who's the challenger and who the contenders are and a blah, blah, blah. And we also know that there are more human beings in the world that would be likely to sit there and watch the show and say, okay, who are the, who are the champions? Who are the big stars? Who are the top guys? And they would recognize them by being the ones carrying the belt so that, you know, you would know to get, okay, I know now this is the guy that everybody's supposed to be talking about. But when everybody is carrying something that signifies that they're the champion of something, then it's a fucking mess. Like you said, nothing means anything because it doesn't, it doesn't elevate those championships. It brings the talent down. Because if, if, if everybody's got one of these things, they can't be hard to get. And then when you've got guys that are obviously visually, you know, kind of eh, and they're still champions, well, yeah, it just devalues the whole deal. But also, if you've got, and that's 20 championships, but a lot of those are tag team titles. So you're taking up 30-something people with all those championships and then you've got to have double that amount of people to challenge for them or else wise you've got multiple people holding or one person holding multiple kinds of titles or programs with multiple people challenging for multiple different there's no clear focus it's just it's for fans of people who like pictures of guys with belts anyway you know what they need instead of belts, Brian, in that company? The wrestlers? What the wrestlers need instead of belts? Yeah. The company? Well, what, the, what, what both? I don't know. No, I don't. They need fewer belts and more auto parts. <laughs> and because seriously, think about it. <laughs> and think about it. Everybody's got a belt. How did I not guess that? <laughs> I don't know how you didn't come up with 
out immediately <laughs> because everybody's got a belt. So even if you lose yours, the guy next to you is going to have one. You could just ask him, hey, can I borrow your belt? And he'll say, sure, because it doesn't mean anything and it's not worth anything. Here you go. You can have it for a while. But imagine, imagine, Brian, if you needed a crankshaft for a 67 Plymouth, are you going to turn to the guy next to you in the locker room and say, hey, can you loan me a crankshaft for a 67 Plymouth? They're going to look at you like you got steam and turds hanging out of your mouth. But the folks at rockauto.com won't do that because they won't see you. You're going to be on the internet. You're going to be on their website. If they saw what you looked like, they would look at you like you had steam and turds hanging out of your mouth. It wouldn't be because of the request you're making of them. It would just be because of your repugnant and off-putting appearance. But nevertheless, you don't have to be good looking to get auto parts from rockauto.com and they do not require that you pass a test proving that you're cosmetically pleasing in order to purchase aforesaid products. All you got to do is log on to rockauto.com. You don't have to go to the brick and mortar store where they only have a few parts and they'll try to talk you into buying one of those and then just say, hit it with the hammer three times hard and it'll fit perfect. No, no, no. At rockauto.com, they not only have all the parts that are ever manufactured, but they know exactly which vehicles they're supposed to go on and you don't have to hit them three times hard with a hammer all you got to do is order the parts you need it will be delivered to your door or to whatever you live in whether it be a cardboard box or under an overpass if you don't have a, specific in a car. street address what about in a car if you're living in the car you're fixing up yeah you don't even have to give them your address you just give them your license number they'll find you <laughs> well, it doesn't work like that but yeah yeah just because the kentucky plate license br549 they'll but track the you down because rockauto.com in addition to not needing brick and mortar stores has amazing security cameras all over the country and they can see whenever <laughs> you're no, they car don't. breaks down, so they, they're identifying potential customers. And every time you buy a part from them, a tracking device in the part... No, they don't. They'll let, no. They'll let, no, it lets them know where your car is in case you need more parts. Not only does that not happen, that highly illegal suggestion or idea that Jim Cordell just put out there, not only does that not happen, but what's great is rockauto.com will sell you the parts and then leave you alone. Who doesn't want well, that? Well, but when they bring you the parts, how do they find you if they don't have the tracker on you? See, you give them your license plate number and you leave the trunk up and you go to sleep. And then the next day, your parts are in the trunk. The trunk is clay. And by the way, if you pay extra, they'll remove from the trunk. If you have any dead bodies no, or stop it. De decomposing material, they'll take them out for an extra charge. They'll put your parts in the trunk, close the trunk. That's the way you know the transaction is finished. Don't have this stuff delivered to your house. Once they know where you live, you'll never get rid of them. Just have it delivered to the trunk of your car. But whether it be a car or a truck, no matter what kind of parts you need, engine control modules, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, framostats, it's all right there. And they're the lowest prices that you'll find. Well, you can find lower prices. If you go to some of these uh, junkyards, that you find in lower income areas and you see some people crawling over the fence, you can get parts from them for lower prices. But sometimes people will come and, well, they'll take those parts back and they'll use them as evidence and you might be caught up in that whole thing. So go to rockauto.com and you'll get parts that nobody's looking for. Actually, you may be looking for them, but to purchase them. I'm not talking about looking for them to repossess them and potentially bring criminal liability onto the person who is currently in possession of those things. Anyway, did I mention that rockauto.com has a catalog yeah. that's remarkably easy to navigate? And safe. And safe. Safe and good for you. So you can see the parts, you can buy the parts, you can choose the parts, you can do the whole thing with it. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? You can, you can spend half as much for these parts as you'd spend for these same parts in different parts of the country. So don't go to Parts Unknown. Stick around here and get parts from us. RockAuto.com. And write JCE in the How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you to them and we told you how they work 
because they want you in on this whole thing. They don't want any surprises. You know, some people, if they don't know going in what they're going to experience, they call the police. Anyway, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. All right, well, we talked about that we're verklempt on our schedule, but the schedules of all of these pay-per-views and big events have gone sideways also now. So, And, and our schedules are fluid as a result of this. So, Brian, we have decided what we're going to do with the this show, the next show, et cetera, as it relates to the SummerSlam pay-per-view. Both you and I thought SummerSlam was on Sunday night because... WWE pay-per-views are normally on Sunday night. Well, and then last time, the AEW pay-per-view that we thought was going to be on a Saturday was on a Sunday. So apparently, since we have now been pushed to Saturday recording because of my construction and SummerSlam is tonight, we can't turn around and do another one of these incredibly entertaining, wildly popular uh, podcasts in less than 24 hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to review SummerSlam and put that up as a breaking news clip on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel first and then insert that, (laughs) I love the word insert, into the drive through program that we do in a couple of days. That's your show, by the way where we will also have some questions, and hopefully the WWE will not do a media scrum. I'm scramming off these scrums for a while after last week. I don't know. Triple H may like talking to the wrestling press. Well, he he did uh, here recently, and we've got some of that in in a minute. But did I say that right? So we got this program today. And we did, we did, the the drive-through was just a few days ago. We covered everything up through, well, nobody watches NXT anymore, and we'll talk about Wednesday's Dynamite here in a few minutes. And SmackDown was blech um, last night. So on the drive-through, we'll be talking about SummerSlam and whatever else happens in the next few days, but you can hear the SummerSlam review first on the YouTube channel. Did I get that out right? In a very clunky manner, I think so. The way it works is... Are you insinuating that I'm clunky? Well, no, I'm insinuating that was a clunky manner. There's a difference. You don't have to be clunky to be demonstrating the clunky manner. Well, why don't you just, since you're in last manner, why don't you just (laughs) say it better than I said it? The SummerSlam review can be heard this week on the drive-thru, my show, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And if you are one of the, what is it now, 310,000 subscribers and growing by the day to the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, you will certainly get some clips, possibly the full review, but certainly some clips from the reviews before the podcast comes out. You know, I heard a few clunks in there myself. That was my chair. Oh, well... You went from squeaking to clunking. All right. But in the meantime, the world of the WWE has not stopped uh, spinning. Uh, Vince is still retired as of right now. We'll see how long that lasts. But some of the the associated family have been uh, speaking, and we haven't heard from Linda in a long, long time. And apparently. And she's associated we, family. She's associated family by marriage at this point, if nothing else. <laughs> um, where was this comment from? How It wasn't the wrestling press. She was somewhere doing something in public. If it's Linda McMahon, I'm going to guess it's some kind of Republican fundraiser or something like that in Florida, because that's where she's based out of, and that's where she's doing most of her work. I'm just guessing, though. I'm not certain. Well, anyway, do you have this this clip that uh, she was asked about Vince at his retirement? I do have this clip. It was going around on Twitter. It is Linda McMahon with a man that has to be seen behind her, just bulging eyes. And <laughs> there's a whole other story with whoever this guy with Linda is. But here's Linda McMahon being asked about her husband, Vince McMahon, leaving WWE. About the biggest story right now with Vince leaving WWE. What, yeah, what are your thoughts? I'm not going to talk about Vince and WWE. I'm here to talk about AFPI. <laughs> I, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on him deciding to leave. I, 
fans of wrestling are, are you can't believe it. Well, you know what? He'll just be deciding on how he's going to spend his free time. I think that's a good thing. Thanks. Are you concerned at all about the investigation? No. The hush money? Come on. So I told you I'm sure. here to talk about AFPI. <laughs> what is AFPI, by the way? AFPI. I will find out right now. Well, there was the little, uh, you could hear Linda winking in that maybe he'll have to find figure out what to do in his spare time, and that's a good thing. She's been sitting, well, not for the last number of years, but she sat for 30 or 40 years and watched Vince get up early in the morning, go to bed late at night, and never stop working in between. And so she probably figures now, you know, is is he going to be forced to actually, I don't know, do something normal? He should move to Mar-a-Lago. Boy, that way he would be there with all of his his friends. But, uh, you know, but you can tell she's like, yeah, now he's going to have to figure out how to be a normal person. So AFPI is the America First Policy Institute. <laughs> we should have known. She's got her own fucking con. She's working. And well, she's also Lin AFPI's chairman of the Center for the American Worker. Oh, boy. Center for the American Worker. How come all of the right-wing anti-communist shit sounds more communist than anything else? I'm here to help the American worker, unless you're an independent contractor, in which case yeah. you're on your own. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here to help the American worker. I'm here to help the American worker out of their uh, retirement benefits, their health insurance, their 401ks. And all of that other stuff that my workers didn't used to get. Miss McMahon, I have $300,000 in school debt. What should I do? Get a job with WWE, sleep with my husband. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but anyway, so Linda's down in Florida putting America first, and Vince is up in Greenwich or Stamford or potentially New York or one of his condos putting the paralegals first. Hey, you brought up what she did say, and she didn't say much. And clearly she did not want to talk about this. And you can understand why. What she did say, is that telling to you? That it wasn't, oh, it wasn't really anything warm or, or helpful to Vince in any way. It was kind of just, eh, we'll have to do something else now. Yeah, well, no, she's, uh, she can't be, she's out working the political fucking con, not the wrestling con. So she can't say anything uh, complimentary to or warm to or defensive of or whatever Vince because then she'll look bad when all this stuff. And who knows? Maybe she doesn't know everything that's going to come out. Uh, but no, of course she's not going to take up for him because she's working her own fucking day. She wants to get back in with President Pig shit and his whole crooked crew. Well, I think she's in with them. I don't think that's the problem, but... Well, I mean, she wants to get back in, in with... He wants to get back in, and she wants to go with him. And that's... I'm sure that's... Uh, because a lot of people said, well, why didn't Vince and Linda get divorced? If Linda could have got half of everything. Right now, they're still married. If Vince was to kick the bucket, I'm assuming that she'd get a lot of everything. And or she got what? 80 or 90 million dollars to run for Senate twice. And you know, those, those Republicans, they're all family values and stuff, unless your family's getting shot or on welfare or, you know, needing to get actual papers to live here, then they don't like those families. But they don't want some divorced woman running for office, for heaven's sake. Do you think Vince should embrace it? Everyone knows I'm fucking around. Everyone knows I like younger women. I want more people to know. And just be seen everywhere with women on his arm. Yes. Like and, 89 but, flair. But here's the thing. You can't blame Vince McMahon for liking younger women. Because how many women exist that are older than Vince McMahon? Think about that. That's a good point. You have cut the fucking potential dating pool down drastically if you only go for women your age or older, you know, and then you've got to hire an assistant to get them in and out of the car. It's going to be interesting to see what he does. He has a few billion dollars, and he didn't want to go. 
You know, Walt Disney, and I'm not comparing Vince to Walt Disney. Sorry, Vince. But Walt Disney, when he kind of got pushed out of his own company, in a sense, with his brother running things, that's when he went and hung out in his backyard with his mini train, and that's when he put together the idea for Disneyland, which he started on his own without the Disney company behind him. Do you think Vince is going to... Do you see him just sitting at home? If he really is disconnected from WWE, and I don't... We don't know that for sure. Well, I mean, he's he's as far out as you can get because look at this. His daughter is co-CEO. His son-in-law is head of talent relations and creative. His hand-picked executive that he brought in to, you know, potentially make the company worth more to sell is a co-CEO. Jeez, I mean, he's as far out as you can get. And Kevin Dunn is still there, and that's obviously a Vince guy. But uh, so uh, the question remains as to how far out of the WWE Vince is or is going to be. But to answer the question you were about to ask and I didn't give you a chance to, there's no goddamn way in hell that Vince McMahon is going to start collecting seashells and taking extended vacations around the country. He's going to work on something. He's going to do something. He's going to make something. If they were to basically shut him off or not take his suggestions, advice, commands, orders, however they're presented on what the WWE should be doing or whatever, he's going to find something else that he can run and call the shots on and build into something and tell people what to do until he's physically incapable because that's what he'd said before. I'm going to work until I'm physically unable to work. And that hadn't changed it. Just what he's going to be doing might have changed. But that mental fucking stance that Vince has is not going to change. It's not like he's just, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm going to the pool. Did he shut down? Because XFL was owned by, was it another company, Alpha Entertainment or something that he started? Yes. When he, I guess, sold the XFL technically, right? Did he sell the XFL to The Rock? I'm trying to remember what exactly happened now with the XFL. Did it go into bankruptcy or did he sell it to The Rock? I'm th- I don't think it went bankrupt because I don't think it was far enough along to, but they did, Rock did purchase from some entity. So the question you're asking is, even if he sold the XFL, is there still an alpha entertainment? Right. Does he still have an entity? Does he still have a company? Something where he could very quickly... If he wanted to do something, mobilize. And of course, we have to be honest, outside of wrestling, Vince has not succeeded really in any of the entertainment ventures he's tried over 50 years. Well, and to be honest, all the businesses that he has failed at were somewhat related, except for the XFL, were somewhat related to wrestling but just not enough for the wrestling fans. <laughs> the the wrestling-themed restaurant didn't really work out well because, as I've mentioned before, when you think of fine dining, the first thing that comes to your mind is the WWE. The Bodybuilding Federation was was kind of wrestling with no fucking fighting, even to the point where Luger was in it. But, I mean, just that was Vince's mistake, thinking that, anybody in any mainstream numbers would want to watch muscular guys go out and pose as a, as a dramatic series. Um, he promoted the Rolling Stones that failed. He promoted you. He promoted, uh, Chavez. Uh, no, he promoted Sugar Ray Leonard. Didn't he promote Sugar Ray Leonard in a fight that bombed, even though he was one of the hottest fighters of the moment. Oh shit. That's right. Well, and also he was part of the, uh, he was part of the Evil Knievel Snake River Canyon, but that was so long ago. That was 50 years ago. But what about the... I was there on the creative team when they bought the Debbie Reynolds Hotel and Casino. Do you remember that? Oh, I remember. They were going to actually open it up as a wrestling-themed casino, weren't they? Yes, until they didn't. And I'm trying to remember, but part of the thing with Debbie Reynolds apparently had had a casino that was branded under her name in Las Vegas, but it wasn't on the strip. It was way off hell and gone to the side of things in a, not a heavily trafficked area. And it had fallen into some type of disrepair as well as ill favor with the locals. 
And they bought this thing for like $10 million, as I remember, and we're going to do that big wrestling casino, whatever. And then the, I, I can't remember all the details, but they found out a bunch of shit of why that that probably wasn't going to be a, a good thing to do or a good place to put their money. And they ended up, I think, selling it at either a loss or maybe a break even a few years later, the property. But that's the point. Whether they've been related to wrestling or not, Vince's track record outside the core business, as they say, has not been good. But, I, I, you know, that's the problem is I can't see him doing anything as another wrestling promotion because then that would be devaluing or potentially trying to devalue if it was successful something that he still owns the majority of. So it's it's not like he's going to start a promotion to compete with the WWE because he still owns most of the WWE and and what he doesn't own most of the rest is owned by his family and cl close friends. Yeah, he's gone from any active role, but if the stock goes up, Vince makes money. Yeah. That doesn't change. So that some people have been oh would he, you know, I mean, not even the ridiculous Vince McMahon's going to all elite. No, that's just delusional. But it wouldn't be delusional if if the situation was different and they had run Vince out of the WWE and he didn't own that much of it and his kids were still not in charge of it. I can see him saying, okay, motherfuckers, I did it before I can do it again and starting something that would try to run the WWE out of business. And that would be interesting. But right now, he's it, he's in... If you magnify the financial situation about four billion times, he's in the same situation as I was when they released me from my consultant's deal with WWF. That meant that I was not allowed to be involved in the developmental program anymore, but I still owned a significant part of the company that was providing their developmental services. You so should, you should give him a call. Yeah, maybe I can commiserate. See, Vince, yeah. remember what what uh, your deputy fornicator John Laurinaitis did to me 15 years ago? Well, now you're in the same situation. If Vince is truly out of the picture, even though he retains his shares, and of course that means voting power, but let's say he's just, that's it, I'm done, I want nothing to do with this. Do you think there's any chance WWE moves from Connecticut? Ooh, well... <laughs> I don't think there's a chance of them moving from Connecticut as long as the current ownership is in place. If they sold to a major corporation, then the, uh, probably anything would happen. But they're not going to they're, – they're, they're trying to move into their new building in Stamford. They haven't got that far yet. Which they're renting. They own Titan Tower, selling that, get it off their books, and then they're renting space. Yeah. And, well, they didn't want to buy another $30 million building because they think, well, if we don't sell this year, we'll sell next year or the year after that. Because Fox may say you're coming to Los Angeles in a few years. Yeah. And plus the old place, you know, they had a woman that come, come in and cleaned up once a week or so, but it was getting drab. But then Vince started sleeping with her and it screwed yeah, everything up. Oh, oh, oh. No, but you know, Triple H and everyone loves Florida. That's what I always think about. I wonder if Vince even though he has a place in Florida too, but if Vince was truly out of the picture, I wonder if there's enough of a pull to keep it there or if there's going to be forces saying, hey, let's move to Los Angeles. Hey, let's move somewhere else other than Stamford, Connecticut. Well, I'm sure if everybody, you know... If you lose Vince and Linda's political power in Connecticut, I mean, I'm really trying well, to think but, of all the benefits now. No, but still, it's a billion-dollar company headquartered miles from New York City. And can you imagine the expense and the cost of, besides the fact they'd have to be pulling out of an agreement with the new building that they've made that they haven't even moved into yet, the expense and the cost of moving everybody, talking about relocating office employees, if they, they didn't want to go, replacing them, all with the idea. I don't think they're going with the idea that we're going to build this thing for 25 years from now anymore. I think they're going with the idea that we need to make sure that everything is as good as it can be in the next couple of years for the rights fee, renegotiation, potential sale, whatever the case. They're not thinking, 
oh golly, it's not Vince and Linda as the young couple ready to beat the world anymore. And they're not thinking, oh, imagine what this will look like in 30 or 40 years. It's like, no, let's let's just make sure we're doing okay and see what happens. We got a good deal coming up here in a couple of years either way. Well, we'll see what happens in the world of Vince and Linda. Will Triple H last that long? And that's because he was in front of the the uh, the press this past week. And they were asking him about his health. And I know you have the, I've seen the clip and I know you have it there. And you and I talked about this right before we went on the air that he's always fairly smooth and it's not easy to rattle him. And he's always, you know, he's, he's the game. He's in charge. Right. But when they asked him about his health, well, play part of the clip. And, uh, and I'll tell you what I've, the impression I got here's triple H talking with, I'm not sure if it's the wrestling media or the media, but here we go. Of how are you feeling health wise? I uh, appreciate you asking. I feel great. Um, you know, gl- glitch, glitch in the road. Luckily for me, um, it was caught. Right. And, and, um, it, it took a little bit to get, to get over it, to get past it, but I'm past it. I'm over it. I got a clean bill of health. I'm a hundred percent. I'm very aware of all of it. I'm very aware of really what's important in your life and your family and, and everything else. Um, but I love this business. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I approach it a little bit differently now. I, I, I realize there's actually this thing called sleep that every now and then you can get, and it's really helpful. Good, good advice for all of you, right? Like, don't be afraid of sleeping. Let me stop, stop, there stop for a Well, I, I was about to say stop there because I was going to say, okay, past the the Tony Khan like stammering, which is unusual. You you needed to see his face uh, on the clip. If anybody wants to look for it on Twitter or whatever, yeah, but, and, I be, and I believe he's talking to Ariel Hawani here. Okay, well, you do, and you'll clean it up. Um, <laughs> but. <sighs> I guess Mama Cornette used to say, "Methinks thou doth protest too much." It was almost like, "Oh, and and he, we're going to go on, we're going to go back to this." But it's he—he he was affected mentally by this episode. I think you can tell in in other comments he's made where it's not like he's blowing it off or downplaying it or whatever. No, it's a big thing. And and hey, love your family and hug your kids and you know, love life. And, but he got rattled by this and well, I play, play the rest of it before we sum everything up. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm back. I'm a hundred percent. I'm ready to go and I'm ready to tear through this and try to put on a big pair of shoes. But like I said, can't really fill, but you're going to, we're all going to do our best and we're going to make, make this thing j- just go to places it's never been before. So considering everything that you've been through, do you have a, a new sense of appreciation for the business. Like you could have never imagined being in this spot. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe you thought you would never be back, right, at some point. So do you just view everything differently? Do you feel that? Do you sense that? I have a new appreciation for life. It's precious. It doesn't last long. Embrace it. Get everything you can out of it because it doesn't last long. And for everybody, everybody, it can be over in a second, right? So, you know, uh, embrace your family, embrace your friends, tell them you love them. Be upfront with it, and uh, you know the things that you love to do in life. Embrace that. Work, work hard because it doesn't last long. You know my my career. People ask me about my career. Am I sad that I'm done wrestling? No, I I, I gave it everything I had. I wrote it till the wheels fell off. That's what you're supposed to do. And and luckily for me, they told me, hey, you shouldn't do this anymore. Sweet, I'm done. I was wrapping it up anyways. To me, it's it. it there didn't need to be the perfect out. It needed to be, I wrote it till the wheels fell off. I gave it everything I had, and here I am. Uh, come out the other side. I, I have a passion for this business that has been the same since the first day I ever saw it. And, uh, you know, I can promise everybody out there, I'm going to do everything I have in my power to make this better than they've ever seen before. Is nice. Oh, great, great. Boom. <laughs> nice, nice upbeat ending to the two minutes of hug your children. I mean, they just, when when he came out and started speaking publicly, what, it was just a few months ago again, and he announced, I'm, I'm never going to wrestle again. And weren't they also saying that he was going to gear back and because of the, I mean, he... He's trying to tell people there he's 100% and he's, he's over it and he's come through the other side. 
wasn't it just a few months ago they were saying he still needs to take it easy and they caught this problem but he has a pacemaker or the defibrillator or whatever the case may be and now all of a sudden a few months after it was like well i'm not going to wrestle anymore that wouldn't be wise and i'm taking things easy and i've stepped back i'm back got a clean bill of health no you're back because the team is in need we understand that i don't think that no matter whether you want to do something or have a passion for it or whatever after he had a near fatal cardiac incident i don't think if he'd had his druthers as they say he would have jumped back into being head of creative and head of talent relations and the number two or three most powerful person in the company boom except the team is in need he's he's dropped weight which is good for you know it shows he's taking care of himself more as a 50 plus year old guy than as a bodybuilding wrestler but facially he looks older maybe that's a result of the the stress uh, you know whatever but I don't think that he would have chosen to jump back in and work even as much or more full time than he was before with, you know, with the health issues he's had, unless it was that the team is in need. So he's trying to convince people now that he's back and he's a hundred percent, but it sounded like an element of what I say sometimes on uh, about guys promos on the shows where it was like he was trying to talk himself into it as much as tell the other people. What do you think, Brian? I don't know. Did I say that right? Well, when I told you about the clip, I told you that I had seen feedback from various people on social media saying, oh, Triple H sounded great, or he's pumped up, or he's back, or he looks good. And I thought to myself, I must be seeing a different clip. I've never seen Triple H rattled like this. To use a bad pun, I've never seen Triple H off his game like this. I've never heard him stutter as much as this. And you brought up his face. He looked older. I mean, look, he's in his 50s now, but looked older, paler. (laughs) I'm sure he's not tanning the same way, but he looked like a guy with a lot still on his shoulders, not like a guy who's getting enough sleep, who's going to tell everyone about the virtues of sleep. I hope for the best. I actually came out of this. If the goal was to make you feel bad for Triple H and root for him, I hope he does all right now. I feel yeah, bad for the yeah. you know, It's a more sympathetic portrayal of, of our friend Triple H. But yeah, that's, that's the thing. And how he's saying, I've discovered sleep. And, you know, he's going to be in a, two jobs where the person who holds either one of those jobs normally doesn't sleep that much. But now here's the thing. I wonder... Without having to work directly under Vince, with Vince, alongside Vince, all of the people in creative, the office, everything, they're probably going to get more sleep just because they're not going to be pushed from 7 in the morning until 9 or 10 at night. And Triple H has an appreciation now, we we know, for sleep, so he's not going to want to do that to other people. So maybe... The biggest takeaway amongst the people at the real top, tippy top in the WWE is going to be, my God, now that Vince is gone, we can actually count on going to bed at the same time every night and the phone not ringing or whatever the case. That might be a plus. Well, the other thing is with talent relations, a lot of it's going to depend on who's Triple H's staff. Remember, Canyon Seaman, (laughs) am I remembering this right? Did he get fired? Was it... Was Triple H still there when he got fired, or was it after Triple H had been gone? Boy, now that I'm not sure of. But Triple H needs a good staff who could deal with a lot of the issues from wrestlers, whether it's in the middle of the night or whenever. Because otherwise, what are you running with talent relations? Is Triple H going to take those phone calls in the middle of the night from everybody? So who's going to be his staff? Well, I think he's uh, he's going to have to call back some of the people that he trusts and that he likes working with and that he knows can you know pass on the the knowledge and the wisdom and the instructions whatever that he wants like vince did when he brought laurenitis and bruce back now (laughs) triple h's gonna have to go find all the people of his that they fired and see if they've got jobs or if they're available to come back or elsewise he's gonna be catching what did we say on that wwe roster they had almost 200 before they fired a bunch so let's say 150 
phone calls from 150 different wrestlers going, oh, what the fuck's going on with me? You know, the other interesting thing is when you think about guys who we consider Triple H guys, primarily guys who were in NXT or came out of NXT, whether they were protected on the main roster or not, we all consider them Triple H guys. Since Triple H, not only since he's been gone, but since even a little bit before then, when we started really wondering about how Vince is treating the AEW, WWE war, or whatever you want to call it, but Triple H saw a bunch of guys that he liked leave the company and sign five-year contracts. That's a big change. The idea that they're now five-year deals that this guy who had been working with so many stars who he now has no access to, I say stars, so many wrestlers, he now has no access to for years. Well, and that is part of the problem is we talked about on one of the shows recently when different creative administrations take over in rapid succession, there's changes made, whether it was WCW 1989 or whether it was, um, you know, any promotion where the booker leaves suddenly, takes some of his talent with him, other guys come in, whatever, and then it repeats a few different times because there's uncertainty. And that's happened more in recent years than it used to. Then not only is sometimes you devalue talent by this booker wants to use them, so they're the main event for three months, but then the next booker thinks they're the shit, so they do jobs, but that guy gets fired and somebody else comes in. and Well, by that time, the guy's meaningless. This is even worse in that today with contracts and with Tony Khan signing five-year deals for fucking people that you're going to get sick of seeing on TV in five months probably, you know, there's no more, there's no hot free agent right now that could be signed anywhere for any company. They're talking about wanting to make a creative splash at SummerSlam. What are they going to do? You can't do a shocking, violent angle. People have seen heads cut off with chainsaws. You can't do, you know, any adult content with language or sex or whatever because of the and I'm not saying you should even, but because the advertisers still, even if they go TV 14, it's not a creative splash unless there's something different, majorly different, involving somebody people want to see, maybe in a new environment. Um, I'm just wondering what they're going to be able to do, like you said, with talent locked up that they can't bring back, that they lost through their own foolishness combined with the fact that there's nobody else really out there that can make any difference just on their name or signing alone. And then you got a bunch of disgruntled guys that have had their names changed back and forth. Uh, their gimmicks changed. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know where they're going. So he's got his work cut out for him, does Triple H, but that's not going to be Easy, quick, or restful, in my opinion. And you know, Jim, on the topic of WWE talent and disgruntled talent, I do have one last bit of audio I want to play here. This is from the Absolute Geek podcast, CM Punk talking about how WWE treated Sasha Banks and Naomi. Let me play you this. I'll put it to you like this. Um, they... Oh boy, people are going to be real fucking mad about this, but fuck it. <laughs> Mercedes and Trinity leave, and they announce on SmackDown that, gosh darn, we're so disappointed in them, and they really let our fans down. Uh, Brock splits. He comes back, obviously. I think he worked the show. But where's Michael Cole saying, man, Brock Lesnar really let these fans down? I walked out. I walked out. They went on TV and they called me a quitter. What's changed? What's the difference? You're going to attack these two fucking poor women who just kind of had enough and they walk. They got bigger balls than everybody there. So what's changed? You know? There, there's nothing much that's changed you know and there's people that there's people that there's people that talk about it and there's people that do it you know and the, the people who lick the boots and 
had the audacity to go on live television and say that about those two women. Fucking cowards and bootlickers. That shit's ridiculous. Why didn't they do it for Brock? They did it for me. You know? I don't know. It's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> Great way to end it there. And of course, I'm thinking that the bootlicker he's referring to is Michael Cole. Well, I mean, just because his breath smells like Kiwi boot polish is no reason. I will, I, I like what he said. I will uh, not take exception with, but uh, break down one thing. We don't know with Brock um, what the conversation was or what the actual statement was before he left, but I have a feeling that they knew they could probably... Once he calmed down, once he cooled off, once they get Heyman on the case, whatever they had to do, they'd probably get Brock to come back to the building. He's still in town. He's answering his phone, whatever. I have a feeling that much like with uh, Naomi and Sasha, when Punk left the building that night, they knew there was... <laughs> There was no reason to waste a phone call. There was he, he, it was not going to be a an easily reversed situation. But otherwise, the, the point is well taken, though. It depends on who you are, how bad they need you, and whether or not they think you will come back. If they think that was Vince's thing from Vince Senior, get the match in the ring, do whatever you got to do to fulfill what's advertised or what your plans are, and then figure out a way to get even with the motherfucker later. So that's why I think that, especially in this situation right now, with Punk, 10 years ago, there was no AEW. Impact was doing better ratings than AEW is now, but there was still, they didn't, didn't consider them competition. And they had a little bit more of a snooty attitude. At this point, they knew with the injuries and the state of the talent pool in the business in general and as you just mentioned guys being signed up for five years across the street you can't get them now anyway they couldn't let brock go anywhere and let's face it you know sasha has been a big star naomi was with her they've never neither one been to the level of the star power that brock has or the leverage he's got as a result of that but and let's also think about the difference in the things that happened Sasha and Naomi got into some kind of argument about creative and walked out. With Vince. <laughs> Brock Lesnar reportedly said, if he's gone, I'm gone. Upset that Vince wasn't there and walked out. CM Punk, I think, called Triple H a doofus <laughs> and said, you need to work with me. I don't need to work with you. And then I think he said also Vince started crying and gave him a hug right before he walked out. So there's a big difference in the way everyone left. Yes, there were, there were <laughs> a numerous differences. <laughs> but yeah, but that that was the way. You don't need to work with me. I, I I don't need to work with you. You need to work with me. That was the best two Triple H. So point is, all those things were individual circumstances and at different times and time periods. But he does have a a point, and the point is, is that if they need you, they adjust how they act toward you or react about you to the level of how bad they need you. And uh, that's shocking, a shocking surprise. But, you know, Triple H discovering sleep after all this time. And I told you, he was one of the, he was the only guy in the clique that wasn't using artificial methods back in the days. But now he's been up for 20 years because he's a Vince McMahon son-in-law and he also works for the company, so he has not experienced sleep now suddenly he's found it, but yet, Brian, here's the fly in the ointment. Here's the rub. He's taken a job again that's going to deprive him not only of the time to get the proper sleep, but also, Brian, you can't go to sleep when you're laying awake at night thinking about goofy wrestlers, crazy as rainbow trouts in car washes. You can't, you lay awake at night, you think about the show, you think about the matches, you think about the finishes. You think about the booking, and if you get poor sleep, Brian, it causes you to gain weight. He don't need to do that. Causes mood issues, poor mental health, lower productivity. And this is a point where Triple H needs to be as productive as possible. And 
you got to be able to boost those white blood cells because they're the ones that's protecting the body against illness and diseases and viruses and bacteria and raccoons and all the things that can go wrong. So you know what we need to do, Brian? We need to send Triple H a big case of Beam's Dream Powder because that way, even if he's tr laying awake at night with his eyes open, staring at the ceiling, worrying about all the things going on with the wrestling business, he takes one drink, one cup of this delicious hot cocoa, and he's going to be out like a light. As a matter of fact, he's going to have flashbacks to when he almost went into the light during his <laughs> heart issues. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. No, he, he <laughs> turned around and he left. He didn't walk into the light. And folks, you will not walk into the light either. You'll walk into a door. You'll walk into the wall. You'll walk in on possibly, I don't know, your wife or sister-in-law engaging in relations in the living room you didn't know were happening because <laughs> you take the beam dream powder. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> you're going to walk into a lot of stuff. You're going to run headfirst in because your eyes are going to be closed because you're sleeping. Good, refreshing, peaceful sleep. Folks, I'll have you know that they have surveyed this, and 98% of the people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream. 99% of people experience better sleep quality, and 1% of the people ran for Senate in the state of Kentucky. We're not sure about what <laughs> happened to them. But I'm telling you, you, just mix the Beam Dream into hot water or milk, gives it a little more body, you stir it up, and enjoy it before bedtime within seconds. Your eyelids are getting heavy. You're feeling sleepy. Your limbs, your arms, and legs are drooping. Suddenly, you fall face first to the ground, smashing your nose into the concrete, and then you know you're ready for a good night's sleep. Folks, <laughs> and if you don't love it, you can get your money back guaranteed. What happens after that is up to you and the collection agency, but for a limited time only. You can get $20 off when you go to Shop Beam. That's B E A M. Shopbeam.com slash J C E. Use the code J C E at checkout. Shopbeam.com slash J C E. Use the code J C E for $20 off. I'm telling you, Forbes is talking about it. The New York Times is talking about it. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and the FDA is talking about it. As a matter of fact, the ICE agents are talking about this. Some illegal beam was coming over the border. No, stop it. What, from the know? Isle of Man. They had to shut that shit down. Only the, the good beam from the folks at shopbeam.com. They were trying to make counterfeit beam. And it was, Who it was, was? there. Well, the people over in Chile, I think it was. Either Chile or Venezuela. They were routing it onto a, a pleasure cruise line from the Isle of Man and then bringing it across the border in uh, Pismo Beach. But we got that shut down. Now, if you buy from shopbeam.com, it's only the recognized, actual, legitimate, official, authorized Beam Dream Powder. Except no substitutes. Or no counterfeits. Shopbeam.com. You don't have to worry about any counterfeits when you buy directly from Beam. Yes, that's why I'm saying go to shopbeam.com. Don't go to these, these bodegas on the corner, the street corner that have actually generic Beam. That's no good at all. Some of this stuff is really just hot cocoa. You know, it's not like this anymore, but it used to be back in the day, the good old days. If you went to like, let's say, um, Williamsburg, if you went to a bodega that had a yellow awning, you could get drugs in there. What, just in Williamsburg or because of the yellow awning? Well, several different areas around there, but certain people ran this operation and uh -huh. <laughs> they let it be known that this is where you go if you want to get stuff. You go to the yellow awning. The yellow awning. It's not that way anymore, though, folks. No, I always heard you're not supposed to eat the yellow snow, but you are supposed to go to the yellow awning. How do you know these things? I know lots of things. Yeah. Shopbeam.com. Slash JCE. It's it's delicious beam powder that's highly authorized and will put you out like a light. All right, before we talk about some wrestling, what are you going to talk about on the Arcadian Vanguard Network this week with all the variety of shows that you produce and star in? 
A variety of shows you can check out today on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam is out right now. John and Randy Smith look at 1982 WWF. Check this out for a talk about Superstar Billy Graham, Bob Backlund, Captain Lou Albano, Bob Orton Jr., and so much more, including the notorious Mighty Joe Thunder. Check it out at mcadampod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention, because a lot of listeners have been getting in touch, saying they really enjoy Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon. Every week, Brian has an incredibly interesting conversation with someone. Check it out today. If you like wrestling talk, check this show out today. Look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts, or go to suawpod.com and check them out today. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. See, you were going to hit that either way if I yelled or not? Yeah, I would have. The Mothership! (laughs) Oh, that's a new one. Where'd that come from? I'm just playing with buttons. How are you still discovering new ones? That's an old one. That's a very old one. We'll go through the archive today at 605pod.com. Of course, it's available wherever you find your favorite podcast, and you can pass gas wherever you please. The Mothership! By the way, you mentioned uh, Captain Lou Albano there on one of the programs, and we talked about Dick Van Dyke earlier in the show. Did you One of Lou Albano's favorite anecdotes was to recount that he was there when Dick Van Dyke changed his name. Do you know what his real name originally was? No, what's that? Penis Van Lesbian. Was that really a Captain Lou Albano That is a Captain Lou Albano. Yeah, yeah, I was there when Dick Van Dyke changed his name. He was originally named Penis Van Lesbian. It was probably pretty funny the first time you heard it. How many times did you hear that joke? (laughs) About 47. (laughs) About 47. But I didn't see Lou all that often, so... Some people heard it much more than I did. Anyway, speaking of hearing enough of something, I don't know now. I'm speechless. I'm at a loss for words. The AEW television program, this was this past Wednesday night, July 27th. We've talked about all the WWE happenings. The WWE, the television shows are just rotten. But the the behind-the-scenes news is intriguing, and you can't get enough of it. Well, in AEW, the television programs, they're not boring, they're not bland, they're not blasé, they're just unprofessional and inexplicable. So maybe that's the difference. Behind-the-scenes news, I don't know. I think all of their news plays out in front of God and everybody right on television. But it's it's at this point, it's almost like the WWE has never been more vulnerable. There's chaos going on behind the scenes. Who's running the show? Time for a upstart wrestling promotion to capitalize with its new talent and its fresh look and its groundbreaking something. And what we've got is a show that I'm convinced now that even the people who watch it every week and like most of it can't possibly understand what the fuck's going on. I mean, I've heard of, you know, some of shit stain used to have the idea, well, we have to make it to where if they miss a week of TV, they don't know what's going on. Because then they won't miss a week. And my response to that was always, you know, a lot of people actually have a life or kids or a job or whatever, and if you make it where they they miss a week and they don't know what's going on and you don't recap them the next week, after about two or three weeks of those, they're gonna, just going to go away because they can't figure anything out. But in this case, you can watch this show every week, AEW, and you still don't know what the fuck is going on. Am I overstating this, Brian? Was this the this past Wednesday night the epitome of what the fuck is happening in front of me and why? I will agree that I do not think they do a good job of explaining 
despite the people that like Excalibur, I don't think they do, they do a good job on commentary of explaining things. I will say that the roster is so bloated right now that it feels like just people show up and disappear and randomly are there and gone. But certain people are there nonstop all the time. Yes, but and it's not even that. It's it's not even the the unfamiliarity with some of the talent, but the fact that from week to week, you can't figure out why these people are doing the things they're doing. People turn on somebody one week and a week later, they turn back and they fucking re-embrace the people that they just were mad at last week. Well, focus has never been AEW strong suit in the booking. In terms of the actual booking week to week, not the matchmaking, but the week to week booking, focus has never been Tony's strong suit. Well, we're going to we're going to go through this show and we're going to attempt to try to tell everybody who's on whose side at this point. It could change at any minute, but they they started out hot with the AEW Interim World Championship, Plumber Moxley defending against Rush with Jose. Roosh. And you know how I know it's Roosh? Did you hear his music? I've I've heard music. I wasn't listening to it. I don't was it uh, Tom Petty? I'm not sure what I'm they played sure, for. It. I'm not sure who performed the music, but from what I heard on TV, his theme song seems to be Roosh. 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 So they just say his name over and over yeah. again. It's Roosh. Well, I was I was rushing to get through this. But again, this guy just showed up. Has he has he had a match yet, Nada? Maybe he had one on YouTube. So he gets a title shot at the world champion. Big win at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Oh, well, there you go. One good win in the right place. Oh, Against his you. brother. <laughs> I don't even want to get started. So this was a situation where apparently Plumber Moxley's the baby face because even though he likes to drink blood and break bones and snap ligaments the other guy had the manager so rush does the jump start from behind and they go to the floor and i will say that rush was aggressive and he looks in good shape and he was all over moxley and they get back in the ring and then they go back to the floor and moxley is now bleeding it took like three minutes and they were on the floor it's forever. Every match now with him well yeah but it, now you just have to, it's like, how long is it going to be before Jane Cargill says the word shit? How long is it going to be before Moxley starts bleeding? And after they were on the floor forever, he threw Moxley back in and Moxley, <laughs> Moxley retaliated for this beating by running, hitting the ropes and diving back out on top of Rush. And then Mox beat Rush up on the floor and just buried poor Paul Turner, the referee. And then they get back in the ring and he beats Rush up in the ring. And then they trade chops. And then the heel takes back over and all momentum was lost and everybody just come to a halt. It's That's every Moxley match. They do the trade chops and then that happens. And also it's not, there's no format to the match with him. It's just, he's going to, somebody's going to beat him up. Then he's going to beat somebody else. And they go back and forth. There's no set of heat and comeback or false finishes or hope spots, or it's just back and forth. And then they go back out to the floor and rush chokes the plumber with the camera cable while the referee is trying to count them out, which they're not listening to anyway. So then after the cable choking, they went to a break. So they're only 10 minutes into the show. The momentum, the advantage in the match has changed back and forth for no apparent reason. Even though Rush is the heel because he's got the manager, they're both either cheating or not cheating at the same level. And Moxley's already bleeding, and they've already gone back and forth and done all the shit on the floor, and now they go to the break, which means we're going to have to watch more of this on the other side. So we come back right as Moxley hits kind of a sloppy superplex, and then they both just lay there. There's no cover. He's not attempting to win. Then they get up and they trade forever again. And then when they've just beat each other to shit, then they started running wrestling spots at 100 miles an hour. And again, I'm thinking about watching this match backwards. By the way, the heel does the wrestling moves better than the babyface. 
so somehow in all of this, Rush was going to try a superplex, but Mox countered by biting his face, and he took a bump into the ring. Jose threw the tablet or the laptop or whatever in the ring and distracted the referee while Moxley is climbing the top or is on the top rope going to come off. But Moxley has to wait for Andre Oleolio to come out to push him off the top turnbuckle. So Moxley <laughs> is up on the top for like five or six full seconds. And it was one of those time standing still moments while the referees with Jose, the tablets in the ring, Rush is laying on the ground and Moxley's on the turnbuckle and nobody's moving anywhere. And then Andre gets there and pushes Moxley off the top. But then here comes the Lucha Brothers and Alex at 100 miles an hour, and they run Andre off out of the building. And somehow, during the period of time the chase scene is going on where they're running Andre out of the building, the camera missed it, so we don't know for sure, Moxley is the one that gets a two count on Rush. After he was just pushed off the top rope by the heel crotches himself, on the top rope and falls into the ring and the, the other baby faces come and run the guy out and then Moxley's the one who gets two count on Rush. And then Rush takes back over. This match is going to keep going. And Moxley won't sell anything for any period of time past two seconds. But now they've done the fucking heel run in and the baby face save run in and they're going to keep the match going. It would not end. And finally, Moxley hit his double arm DDT from just out of nowhere. But Rush kicked out of that, so Moxley turned over and got the choke on him and choked him out. So they can make even a finish like that as flat as possible. Either win with your goddamn finish... Or don't fucking hit it and let the guy kick out of it and then just grab something else and win with that. Jesus fucking Christ. Fuck, he's rotten. Plumber Moxley, <laughs> I trended for saying this, and a lot of people happen to agree with it, come to find out. He's the worst pushed wrestler in the world. And it's all the same. What'd you think of this fiasco? 20 minutes of this, by the way. It went on for a very long time. You summed up a lot of my thoughts. Uh, the one thing I wanted to point out again, because I always do, is just in the middle of the spot, the middle of the match, there's no reason to do the trading chops or trading blows or trading forearms or any of that shit. In the middle of a match, it happens like multiple times a show now. I don't like Moxie's matches. There are a lot of people that do. But like you just said, after... The controversy where you trended for saying that he's the worst wrestler in the world. I'm not on an island. No, we did hear from a lot of people that actually agreed with you that said, I thought I was alone. I thought it was me. There's a lot of I thought it was me's out there when it comes to John Moxley. Just not for me. I can't wait for Punk to get back and just put the Blackpool group minus Danielson and the Jericho group, put them in like a segment every week. And then give the Bucks in their camp a segment every week. And then let the rest of the show be the good wrestling. Well, we'll get to poor Brian Danielson. Jesus Christ, how the mighty have fallen. Jericho music played, and here came Jericho and many of the appreciators. Uh, it was Sammy and Ty Conti and Anna Jay and Cool Hand Luke. Now... Daniel Garcia was not out there because he's going to be in the main event tonight, of course. Is Daddy Mac Mac Daddy hurt or did his head swell further and they had to ice it or what, what has happened to him? He wasn't there. I don't know. And at this point with AEW, I just kind of figure everyone's hurt. So Jericho cut a promo on Moxley because Moxley's still in the ring. Now, we've had 20 minutes of this god-awful shitty match, but... Now the Shakespeare comes into play where we're going to have our drama. So Moxley stand there, list to Jericho and Jericho says that his role is better than Moxley's role. And I don't know what baked goods have to do with this. Jericho looks like somebody hit him in the face with Floyd and not the barber, the bat. 
between the gig marks and the broken nose and the black eyes and the... So then he talks for a minute and then he hands the microphone to Anna Jay and let Anna Jay talk. Anna Jay is now Anna J-A-S, which is sort of like Nikki A-S-S. And I wrote at that point, God, this is local cable access wrestling school stuff. Her, her promo, I mean. And it, I'm sitting there looking at Jericho standing there in between Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti and Anna J.A.S. and Cool Hand Luke. And it looks like Chris Jericho doing an appearance on stage at a high school assembly. With the maybe the, these are the honor school students that got to stand up on stage with him. So Moxley hates the sports entertainment and he answers Jericho and makes fun of his new gimmicks and his nicknames and his trademarks. That promo wasn't actually bad because actually, this is the best thing. It's two guys that we don't like that also don't like each other so they can knock each other and we can kind of enjoy that. But so the gist of this whole conversation is again mark booking moxley doesn't want the wizard he doesn't want the the rock star wannabe that we've been getting lately he doesn't say i want the old chris jericho the chris jericho that was the undisputed wwe champion the chris jericho that main evented pay-per-view against the rock or whatever the fuck he has to go back and he doesn't even say i want the chris jericho from the early days of aew he says i want the chris jericho from the super j cup what the not the chris jericho that drew mega money and was one of the biggest wrestling stars in the world 15 years ago he wants the Chris Jericho from the Super J Cup 30 years ago. And not even the original Super J Cup, the second one. And, I mean, you know, hey, if he wanted any more from Chris Jericho, he'd have to be wearing a diaper and carrying a fucking rattle and drinking out of a baby bottle if he wanted him to go any further back. But he doesn't want the guy, the Chris Jericho that was a big star. He wants the Chris Jericho off of tape that he watched in his basement when he was fucking homeless in Cincinnati or whatever. Well, that wasn't the big one. It was all about, I want the last survivor of the heart dungeon. The last survivor. That I was about to say in the last line, I was, want the last survivor of the heart dungeon. Chris and Lance <laughs> went to train with the heart boys. They didn't train with Stu. They didn't train with the hearts. Isn't a story that well, one yeah, of the hearts showed up on the first day and never showed up again. <laughs> yeah. That the heart, what was it? Bruce? It was Bruce Keith. that started the and training think, camp. Okay, one of those two, yeah. Bruce or Keith started the training camp, and then <laughs> Chris and Lance both went from Winnipeg or wherever the fuck they went from and showed up, and I think they saw a Hart brother a day or two, and then it was... They ended up teaching the class that they were in. They ended up being the instructors, because they were only two that looked like they could stand up without help. Wouldn't Teddy Hart be the last survivor of the Hart Dungeon? In terms of wrestlers and age and who would have actually been there? I, I think they're still waiting for the results of the DNA test before they claim Teddy. Harry Smith, maybe? Harry Smith, there you go. But the point is, no, Chris didn't survive the dungeon because he wasn't in the dungeon because the dungeon was closed to all but intermittent family members at that point. But so this whole thing, that was the first 30 minutes of the show, and apparently we're going to have to watch... Because Punk's not going to be ready for All Out or All In or whatever happens Labor Day weekend in Chicago. We're going to have to see the plumber against the trademarker. Maybe. If it, Well, if either one of them lasts that long. They've well, still got, what, a little over six weeks. They set up an angle, or they did an angle to set things up on Rampage, which I know you didn't watch last night. For some reason, I decided to watch it. You need to watch the show. It's so bad. You need to watch how bad it is. It's really I've, bad. I've, I've figured that out before. That's why I don't watch it. I don't need to watch it to figure out that it's a rotten program. Apparently, they're setting it up. So Jericho, I think Wednesday, is going to go up against Wheeler Yuta. And the winner of that match gets Moxley. Oh, good. Because Lord. there's the intrigue of Yuta's had several other matches with Moxley. 
Yuda, who one of the listeners got in touch and said he sounds like Ben Shapiro on the mic, and he really fucking does. At least it's not Ben Stein, but go ahead. But he's kind of over with some of those fans there, but they're going to do that, apparently. Him against Jericho, leading into whoever wins, and you got to think it would be Jericho, but at this point, you don't know what the booking there. <laughs> Him, I have a feeling Jericho's not going to be doing a job for Wheeler Useless. If Tony get if Tony gets him to do a job for we, for Wheeler Yuta, and you almost got me saying the wrong name now, that would be the most impressive job as a promoter and booker that Tony's ever done. Well, and actually, what if they're going with Moxley and Jericho for the title at the pay per view? Then what should happen is Jericho hospitalizes Yuta on Wednesday night. I've been trying to remember where we saw it most recently, and I can't remember. And it maybe have happened more than one time, but the whole, I don't want you. I want the 1985 version of you. I want the version of you that used to eat yeah. wood. I want the version of you that likes bugs. Like, we've seen this several times, and I can't remember who did it recently, but we've seen this several times. Yeah, you know what that does? That points out to people, yeah, that... It, 20 years ago, that guy's a lot better than he is now. He's a shits right now. No wonder he don't want to wrestle that guy. He wants to wrestle a guy he was 20 years ago. But guess what? He's 20 years older. So I guess he's just the shits. I always like to point out the flaws in, uh, in my pay-per-view main event as a booker, as a promoter. I always like to point out the flaws in those people that are in the match that's supposed to sell my tickets and draw me money. Can I say one more thing? I wish you would. I'm really happy that Anna Jay is getting a shot. Despite whatever you think, out of all the women there, she's been athletic. She seems into everything she does. She's not perfect. And of course, she came out of QT school. She didn't come out of Tom Pritchard school or anything. But she has shown a lot and she's young. So I want to talk directly to her. That guy is going to tell you a bunch of really bad advice. <laughs> Don't listen to it. Seek out someone else, whether it's CM Punk when he comes back. Seek out anyone else. Don't listen to Jericho. It'll be a disaster. That's all I want to say. Speaking of disasters, right after this 30-minute festival of ignorance, Sockface announced the trios championship that we've heard about, complete with the pretty belts. So that's the big major angle that they were saying they held off the third in the series between the Hardly Boys and FTR because a big major angle uh, is coming up and, and there's where the Hardly Boys and Twinkle Toes are going to reunite and win them some more belts so they can have belts too and not do a job for the best tag team in the world. I question if we're ever going to get a third match with FTR and the Young Bucks and I think the Young Bucks right now, recognizing what's happened, are going to do everything in their power to make themselves as super over as baby faces as they can in their segments. So let's see what happens. Because they see what's going on. They are hypersensitive to what wrestling fans are saying, good and bad. They see what's going on. They're just hypersensitive. But they've spent all this time trying to be these, these shit-disturbing, gum-chewing, smarmy-faced little heels. And I think it's worked fairly well in that people now see that they're so good at that, that that must be their real personality. And now they're going to have to go out and fake being nice again so that they can try to get the fans to cheer for them so that it won't be so obvious that everybody likes FTR more because they're better. And the kids just from Cucamonga just cannot accept that. Speaking of accepting things, I've accepted it now that Dante Martin is going to wrestle once every three months and hurt himself. Did you hear the news after this match? He hurt himself. He hurt himself. Yes. Tony Schiavone did an interview with him. He's going to wrestle Sammy Guevara tonight. It wasn't a bad promo. He's got more oomph to him now, and he didn't get jumped and physically attacked, even though he was backstage, so that wasn't bad. But then, since Sammy has Ty, Dante's big go-home line was going to be tonight, Sky Blue's going to be in my corner. And I said it in a more exciting way than he did. He just kind of blurted it out and looked dumbfounded and trailed off. 
So that's the big news. Sky Blue will be there to offset Ty Conti. There's a reason why when a heel has a girl in his corner that you wait until he's against a main event guy and the main event guy says, I'm going to get a girl to fucking keep an eye on your girl and it needs to be a girl with a name. But when you just do it, when every match you book, oh, I'll go find a girl in the locker room. There's a million of them. Hey, Sky Blue, come here. Then, then you've just taken the edge off for when somebody does it and it means something. This was never said on TV that I heard, and I did have it on mute a few times during the match. But I believe I was told by someone there that Sky Blue and him are in a relationship. It's just, I don't care. It's just we were never told that. Let them go to the movies. Let them go to Steak and Shake. I don't care, but Sky Blue is nobody, and Dante's an underneath talent, and they're just rushing all this shit. Anyway, then... Oh, my God. The FTW title match. And I don't know where to begin. Dan Housen is challenging Ricky Starks for the FTW title. And they play, Dan Housen comes to the ring. Then they play a heel Starks video that was great. Tremendous. He was such Tremendous. a star. Yes. He looked like a million dollars. And, and it it's, it's new. We haven't seen that. And then he gets a bigger, more grand entrance. And he looks great and like a star. And I think, okay, they're finally going to pull the trigger on pushing Ricky Starks. The only problem I had was it makes it silly that he's wrestling Danhausen, but at least, you know, we've got something. He's finally, Tony Khan has finally realized, I don't need Daniel Garcia on fucking TV every week. I've got Ricky Starks. I could put him on TV every week. People that actually watch. And I thought that for about three more minutes. So, Danhausen curses Ricky Starks, and Starks responds with a big boot. But then he walked into Danhausen's boot, and then Danhausen gave him a Northern Lights suplex. And I wrote, What are they doing? Danhausen is getting offense. I thought this was going to be okay. People like Danhausen. So when Ricky Starks beats the shit out of him in two minutes, it gets Starks over, and those people are pissed. Well, suddenly Danhausen is kicking the shit out of Ricky Stark. Danhausen doesn't know how to do a schoolboy. Did you see the schoolboy? I saw the attempt. The fuck? And he got a two count on Starks with that. And finally, Starks comes up, hits a spear, boom, one, two, three. And I wrote, what the fuck is this? It started out so good. Here comes Starks. They've got the video, the music, the entrance. And he's selling for Danhausen, and then, so then he gets the microphone and does the promo again like last week. I've got more gas in the tank. I want another challenger. The only difference in last week was this time when he said that they paused 10 or 15 seconds before playing the music. They're listening because at least, well, I want another. Send somebody out here, and nobody comes at it. Come on. You make the heel. You force him to go, come on. It looks like it's impromptu and unplanned. Somebody has to have the guts to come out here. Then you play some music and somebody comes out. It's just a little thing. But however, having said that, the music plays and here comes Hook. Now let's recap this, Brian. Stop me if I misstate anything. Taz is the leader of Team Taz, right? And on commentary here, yes. And on commentary here. Ricky Starks is a member and has been of Team Taz since the inception of Team Taz. Probably the best member of Team Taz. Yes, Ricky Starks also has the FTW title belt, which was introduced in AEW by Taz because it's Taz's belt from ECW that he started and did the whole thing, and we talked about the FTW title belt. So, Ricky Starks, the FTW champion, Taz's belt that Taz brought into AEW to give to a member of Team Taz, who, and goddamn, now 
the member of Team Taz that is the FTW champion that holds Taz's belt is being challenged by Taz's son. And Taz not only doesn't know that it was going to happen, but has no explanation for why it might be happening. They actually even said, well, we don't know why this might be happening. And then Hook gets in and takes over on Ricky Starks and suplexes him. And then Starks takes over and suplexes Hook. And their shit is better than the fucking shit with Danhausen and certainly better wrestling than we got with Moxley and <clears throat> who's he, what's he at the start of the program. But I wrote in capital letters, who are they pushing? Who's the heel? Who's the baby face? Who's, the, who's getting the push? Why is this happening? Why are they fighting? And then Starks hits a spear and goes for his finish and Hook's re Hook reverses it and gets a choke on him, and Starks taps out. The son of Starks' manager and coach that started the FTW title beats a member of Team Taz for the FTW title, and Taz has no explanation for why any of this is going on. And I wrote, what the fuck is happening? And so, so then Tony gets in the ring with Starks after the break, I think, with Starks and Hobbs. There's Hobbs there now. And by the way, if you needed to put somebody on TV every week and you have a choice of Daniel Garcia or powerhouse Hobbs, so Tony's in the ring with Starks and Hobbs. And suddenly Starks is a babyface, even though he was a heel in his goddamn entrance video 10 minutes ago. He's okay with losing because he made the most of the FTW title, like he's made the most of everything else. He's worked his ass off. He deserves to be able to talk for more than 40 seconds. My goddamn time is right now. <laughs> now, suddenly, he breaks into doing the best babyface promo that I've heard on this fucking show in weeks to where it's, he's tired of waiting. He's tired of people saying his time will come. My goddamn time is now. And the people are starting to get with him because they know that while the rest of these fucking indie outlaw ass wipes and friends of the EVPs and outlaw talent of various stripes is forced down our throats every week on television on this goddamn amateur fiasco of a show where people slip out of fucking cages they can't get unlocked through the bars and here's ricky starks a talent that's been hidden like jay lethal like powerhouse hobbs like a number of people we've talked about you want to see more of them you can't find them because they're not friends with the boss, and the boss doesn't dress up like them for Halloween. So the people are behind Starks, and they're getting with him. And I'm thinking, all right, this is going to be great. Maybe we got Starks and Hobbs are going to fucking become a babyface tag team over all of this shit. <laughs> and just then, as Starks says, so me and Hobbs are going to Hobbs clothesline Starks from behind in his bad neck and almost took his head off for a shoot. A guy that broke his neck about six months ago, he had to clothesline him on the side of the, the head. And now, Taz is surprised again just because it's his team and all of his hand-picked members. He has no idea why they're beating each other. And his family, his son, He's completely clueless as to why they're beating each other up in front of him. And Hobbs hits Spar Sparks. Hobbs hits Starks with a spine buster and stands over him. So now Hook is the FTW champion. Starks is a baby face, but his program apparently is going to be with Hobbs, his partner who just stabbed him in the back for reasons that their own manager and coach has no idea of. That's my explanation for what I saw, Brian. Did I miss something? No, you got it all, but 
let's focus on some positives here. Ricky Starks, we've been saying here for a while. And if it wasn't for all the awful booking, all of the awful booking in this one segment, I think we would say, wow, this was his coming out party. He really showed yeah. everyone what he has here tonight. In a package, on the mic, in the ring, the reaction from the crowd. Instead, it was just a puzzling series of events. That why would anyone think this was the best way to go? I'm totally against Ricky Starks being a babyface right now. Him and Hobbs have been heels that haven't been used. I've been waiting for them to get a run to do something, either together or just as two singles who are friends. Now we're going to have to watch them feud against each other. That's not really what I want. Right and, then, and then who gets over? Whose Nobody, side will they, Taz they, take? Well, besides that, Starks needs a push. Starks has not had one. Starks has been on the periphery of everybody else's shit and stop and start and disappears and comes back and whatever. And Hobbs has never gotten a chance to get started. I can't remember the last time he wrestled on television. He's never had a match, my God, two weeks in a row. Well, that would just be insane. But it's been months since we've seen him wrestle, hadn't it? And he's usually in multiple man situations. So now you've got two guys, whether they're baby faces or heels, and both guys have been both. Remember, Hobbs started as a baby face with a Sad story about seeing his brother get murdered. Then two weeks later, he switched heel. But I, I, I think they're both great heels. But they both need a push. They both need wins over people on television. They both need some kind of coherent strategy to elevate them to be bigger names. And none of this is it. Because if they're wrestling each other, one guy's going to come out on the losing end. That's why you don't put people that you need to get both of them over against each other. So I, I, uh, Brian, I got to be honest with you. At this point, I thought, what do I do? Do I turn this program off now? I'm obviously, I was never a heavy drug user, but something has happened in my brain. It's, I'm not connecting with this i'm not understanding what's going on it can't it has to be me it can't be that the programming is inexplicable that's what i thought at first but then you know what i did i called somebody and they told me no it's not you the programming is inexplicable i just needed somebody to talk to because you got to take care of your brain and your mind for most people it's the only one you're going to have and when you're watching stuff like this that's just visually off-putting and mentally stressful, you got to talk to somebody to make sure that it's not you, it's indeed the wacky situation that you've been observing. And that's what the folks at BetterHelp can do. They can talk to you, they can, they can perk up your brain, they can make you realize, hey, you're not in this all alone, we feel the same way. That's what you got to do. How we care for our minds and ourselves in affects how we experience life, how everything that we do goes. So, supporting a healthy brain, you can take power naps. We know about good night's sleep, but you can also learn a new language. You can learn to speak to the natives in AEW in their own particular, peculiar language and their strange customs and habits. Or, <laughs> I'm telling you, go out there and, and see them in the wild. About? The AEW wrestlers in the wild, they have weird customs and strange habits. They eat a variety of loathsome living creatures. But, uh, but you know, it's all part of the global culture, and that's how you expand your mind. And you can call the folks at BetterHelp if you have to watch this program, and you'll say, is it just me? And they'll say, no, it's not just you. Everyone feels this way, and they'll make you feel better. Because BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video and phone and even live chat-only therapy sessions, so you don't have to get on camera, you don't have to go out in public, you don't have to sit in front of anybody if you don't want to. You can talk to them on your terms, remotely. Or, in the case of my terms, not at all. 
I find it's easier if I don't talk to people. But a lot of people need to talk to somebody. And if you do, BetterHelp is there. It's more affordable than in-person therapy. You can be matched up with a therapist in under 48 hours. And these folks aren't just, you know, local yokels from the Kmart. They're licensed professional therapists. They know what they're doing. They can take you apart and put you back together again. And right now, folks, at BetterHelp, that's H-E-L-P, BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, our listeners, the good people, get 10% off their first month's services. That's BetterHelp.com, slash J-C-E, 10% off your first month's services. And you actually schedule your phone calls or video chats for Thursday morning. That way, you watch this show on Wednesday night. You make notes on what you didn't understand, and you have a therapy session on Thursday morning, and they can straighten you right out. Then they'll tell you flat out that Tony Khan's the one that's screwy. It's not you. What if they're going to be especially busy on a Thursday if you tell everyone to send everyone to call up on a Thursday? Well, no, because most people don't watch AEW. No, they don't. All right, should we jump back into this? <laughs> yes. Sammy Guevara and Dante Martin with Ty Conti and Sky Blue and and I guess her tag team partner, C. Green. I forgot to pay attention to this match because to be honest, it was what it... There was leaping and flipping and springboards and backflips and diving and... It did just basically looked the same as everything else because of all of that. Uh, the girls all got in a fight afterwards, including Anna JAS, who came down, who's reconciled with Ty Conti, who she turned on three weeks ago. And um, the takeaway from this is Dante does a springboard off the apron onto the top rope, then jumps from that rope to another rope then does a backflip off that rope and is supposed to land on his feet so that Sammy can jump up from the other apron to the top rope and jump off backwards and hit him with a cutter of some description. Brilliant spot. And uh, I saw that in the 72 Olympics. Olga Corbett and Nadia Comaneci. Did a tag team fucking uneven parallel bar and used that spot. The point is Dante flips backwards off the top rope and lands in the middle of the ring for this meaningless fucking finish that nobody would remember two days later because of all the other shit on this program that looks all the same. And he lands and he hurts his knee. And then he staggers over and Sammy jumped backwards off and caught him in an approximate cutter, but because Dante was off balance and it already hurt his fucking knee or ankle or what was it the knee or the ankle? I thought it was his knee, whatever it is. So when, when Sammy gives him the cutter, it almost, he almost landed on the leg that fucking Dante had just hurt because Dante couldn't throw himself forward. His leg was bent up on it. The point is it was a goddamn monkey fucking a football. And now this guy's hurt again. He nailed perfectly three or four death-defying leaps to the top rope and flips outside and everything. And if he'd done half of that number, it might have been great and showed that he was exciting without taking it into the level of the phony gymnastics that everybody else does. But instead, he's got to do all that shit and then try to do that fucking finish and hurt himself. I don't blame the guy he's trying to get over. I blame the people that are not teaching these guys how to get over and how not to do ridiculous shit that is too much risk-reward ratio off the chart, whatever the case, and how to make them remember it. He did five spectacular things, hurt himself on one of them. If he'd have done two that he could do perfectly, he had to, he'd have two more that they hadn't seen that he could do later and he wouldn't have hurt himself. And at the at some point 
he could try to learn how to wrestle in between jumping and flipping so that he'd stay over once he gets over with the jumping and the flipping. So now Dante Martin's out of commission for flipping off the top rope and landing on his feet. And then they did a parking lot pre-tape. Remember I mentioned we sure would like to see Jay Lethal on a weekly basis like we do Jericho Stooges and the rest of these fucking outlaw dipshits that Tony Khan wants to adopt and fucking give them his inheritance. You think Daniel Garcia will be starting a new wrestling promotion in 20 years because old Tony Khan will say the same thing to him that Tony's dad said, I'm just going to give you your inheritance now so I can see you have fun with it while I'm still alive? When do the adoption papers get finalized with Tony and Garcia? I don't know. So there was a parking lot pre-tape. Lethal and Dutt and Zippy the Giant Pinhead had an argument with the Puddin' Gang and Pockets. So that's where Jay Lethal is now, trapped with the Puddin' Gang and Pockets. How about the Jungle Boy promo? Was that, have we figured out now why we never hear Jungle Boy speak? I did. I thought this is the <sighs> best thing he ever did on Are the mic. Can, oh, boy. Well, well, the best thing, that's like being the nicest guy in prison. Can you name another time he's been on a microphone? But no. <sighs> Brian, look at it this way. Tony Schiavone's in the ring. He brings that Jungle Boy. And J they should have done what JR started doing, call him Jungle Boy Jack Perry. So now that he needs to be a human being, he'd actually be one. But it doesn't matter because he ain't going to be able to pull it off. Jungle Boy comes out to the ring with the emotion of a constipated mailman on his route, accompanied by the dinosaur that was interesting for two weeks when he was a heel at Christian Cage's monster. Now we've got the dinosaur back with Jungle Boy, and apparently he's Jungle Boy's best friend. So the point is, the reason why I thought this fucking sucked pond water is this kid has great charisma when he's in the ring, when he's selling. And we've said when he, when he works with the other indie guys, it's just meaningless drivel. But when he's in there with somebody... The MJF match was was excellent. When, or when he's in with a veteran, when he's in with an actual wrestler instead of a gymnast, he's good. He can sell. He gets sympathy. He's got some fire to his comeback. He just has no personality. And now the knucklehead comes out, bleh, and Tony Schiavone's in the ring, and he asks Jungle Boy to respond to all the recent events. Jungle Boy snatches the microphone, and Tony just walks off. And Jungle Boy starts screeching. I can't even call it screaming, because it was screeching. He sounded like a 12-year-old girl now, but he's gone from a monotone, boring fucking non-presence to, Christian Cage, you're the biggest pussy I've ever met. It was not a flattering tone for the supposed baby face to take. He sounded like a fucking teenager pissed off over his stolen video game. No wonder he's never shown emotion before. If this is what he does when he's trying to show emotion, he had written down what he wanted to say and he had memorized it complete with choreographed facials and gestures that he made at the same time while still putting no meaningful inflection into his material, he was either screaming or talking. He studied the script, and he gave a stiff, memorized recitation of same. And to make sure that everybody knows that he's finally lost his cool and he's gotten mad, because before you couldn't make him mad. Well, now he's mad. That's why he said bitch-ass, shit, pussy, and pricks. All in the same interview. And then Tony comes back in and asks about Dino because we we need to tie that loose end up about how that he Dino was alongside Christian Cage doing his bidding for two weeks and then suddenly with no explanation. Well, the explanation is the monster is my best friend. 
And he was protecting Christian Cage so nobody got to him before I did. That was the explanation of why that suddenly Dino, for once in his miserable existence, was an interesting heel instead of a doofus babyface for two weeks. Because he was protecting... What do you think then that Jungle Boy's got to go and apologize to Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman? Say my best friend here, he was just trying to fool Christian Cage into thinking that he was on Christian's side instead of mine. That's why he fucking threw you through furniture and choke slammed you and broke all your ribs and beat the fuck out of you and left you laying in a puddle of fucking goo last week because he was working Christian because I asked him to. So sorry. This does not make any fucking sense. So after two more shits, Jungle Boy starts telling a story and this was, one would think that you could not figure out a way to fuck up getting sympathy when your father was a movie and TV star beloved by millions of fans and recently over the past few years died. But somehow he couldn't even muster up real words or emotions for that. And he had to prepare his material that sounded like it was coming off the goddamn South Park wrestling episode where they were emoting under a spotlight. And he starts telling the story about he how he dug his own father's grave. He was there in that hole in the ground with his uncle. My tears fell in the dirt and turned it to mud. Did you hear that, Brian? I did hear that, yeah. I just want to make sure I wasn't fucking having delusions. My tears were falling in the dirt, turning it to mud. And then before, I don't know what happened to the muddy grave that he was digging for his father. Because we will never find out because they jumped the gun. There was some statement that he was made. He wouldn't have gone into talking about his dead father and not put a period on it before being interrupted to put a period on at least one sentence so we'd see how he got out of the grave, except they piped Christian Cage in too quick. He's on the screen from the back, and he's watching them on the screen. So it was a little awkward. And he had to say, hey, 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 can you hear me? Maybe his sound wasn't up in the arena. I don't know. But finally, he breaks in, and he says that Dino made a mistake and that the reason why Christian, he says, ran last week is so he wouldn't hurt Jungle Boy, but now he's going to bury him next to his dad. This was already rotten, and it was getting a lot rottener. Now, the highlight of the program over the past few weeks, Christian Cage's heel interview has been supplanted by a bad, stagey, phony, overacted, melodramatic babyface promo and Christian doing a fucking pre-tape in the back that wasn't very good because this whole thing doesn't make a goddamn lick of sense. So, Christian Cage with Dino, I think, would have worked. I think Christian Cage was doing great heel promos and we know he can work and his shit makes sense. And Dino, that was the perfect spot for him. Don't let the big goof talk. Let him go out and smash people. Instead, we've got now Dino's back in the fucking Jetsons camp, or the Flintstones camp, rather, Jetsons. Sorry, that was Astro. Dino's back in the Flintstones camp with old Jungle Boy. And Christian is going to apparently have to wrestle, I guess, Dino to get to Jungle Boy. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Explain any of this to me, Brian. Well, I can't do that. I will say I liked it. I got a kick out of it. I don't think Jungle Boy was nearly as, I don't even know what to call what you did, screeching or prepubescent sounding. I don't think that it came works. across. I don't think it came across that way. Now, he did immediately call him a pussy. So right away, you're like, oh, wow. Let's see where he goes. And he was going for a little while. And I agreed not all the material was good, but it was the most fire we've seen from him. It was fake fire, though. It's not real. He's acting. It's obvious. I started howling with laughter, though, while he was talking about burying his father. That's when Christian Cage 
cuts in and he's just standing there. Now, Jungle Boy has pointed out that Christian's going through a divorce, that his wife should call Jungle Boy. Christian just no sold all that and he was just ready with his own insults. I got a kick out of it. But as good as Christian was those first two weeks, and he was still good here, it's just now what should have been drawn out better, what should have been booked out better, planned out better. Everything's just kind of happening. I mean, look at the Ricky Stark segment. And then look at this. It's like, okay, here's like four months worth of stuff. Let's just do it all tonight. <laughs> so I don't know what they're doing here. Uh, so yeah, and you're then... right, though. The Varsity Blondes, who apologizes to them? And he was yeah. going to protect Christian Cage so no one else could get to him. Who was going to try to get to him? You're the only one who really hated him, Jungle Boy. Yes, and he hasn't wrestled against anybody else besides the the varsity blondes that he never tagged in until they were decimated by the fucking giant fucking lizard. Uh, the next uh, segment was the Hardly Boys in the parking garage with their their little mascot, Brian Cutlet. Brian Cutlet, Brandon. Brandon Cutlet, Brandon Cutlet. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Don't do that. Yeah. Slander your name. No. So the the bland, tasteless piece of white meat that does their camera work, Cutlet. And they're talking about the trio's title because they're walking in the parking garage and suddenly they see Hangman Adam Page. And it's awkward because, you know, they used to be friends, but now they're not friends anymore because of all this stuff that's gone on. And they go, hey, man, we don't even want to talk to you forever. And then the dork order come in and interrupt. And they they all... If all these people were in their teens or maybe, what, 11, 12, 13, 14, instead of late 20s at best and, and late 30s for some of them, then people might talk this way to each other. But does, any, does anybody want to hear professional wrestlers talk to each other like a bunch of goofy fucking nerds hanging out at the goddamn park skateboarding? Oh, man, I know I really wanted to talk to you. Is it just so childish and simple-minded no this stands out even in a show that has puzzling and bad promos at times the stuff with the bucks it's like i mean i hate to jump on what you say because people just think you're ripping on them but when you see shit like this and you use the word junior high school there is some validity there yeah that's what this seems like it's like sweet valley high because they're all soft there's what did undertaker say they're soft they're, that's what it is. They're just soft. They want to play wrestler and they want to fantasize that they're these big, tough hero wrestlers, but they're not. They're fucking soft. They're soft children and they bicker with each other with their meaningless arguments. And the only people that like that kind of thing are other soft, meaningless, bickering teenagers. And it's douchebags speaking douchebaggery. And it's phony on top of that. But they're setting themselves up because they'll bring fucking Twinkle Toes in and they'll be the six-man tag team champions so they can all have belts and take pictures with them and play Twitch, play Twitch with them. Do you play Twitch or do you run Twitch or get on Twitch? What do you do with Twitch? Gene Anderson had a Twitch. It came from a stroke. You, broad <laughs> you broadcast on Twitch. You don't use... Yeah. Well, I guess you could say you're using Twitch, but... Hey, look, this is what they want. They'll get their Kenny back. They got Adam Page and the Dark Order. Let them have their segment where they all play with each other. They'll have the six-man belt, so they'll have belts. So they'll feel good about themselves. They'll have Kenny there with Adam Page. They can work on some teenage melodrama that will turn them into big baby faces, get the reaction they really want. Good for them. Well, moving along more, more swiftly. Then they had a handicap match. Tony Nese and the lawyer Mark Sterling against Swerve. I know they've set this up in their mind with what's gone on the past couple weeks. But again, putting the manager in the handicap match, there's no reason because, for one thing, he's not over. He's never going to get over. Everybody knows he's not a lawyer. And not only does everybody know he's not a lawyer, he doesn't even try to act like one. Everything's comedy. Everything's phony. He does a parody of wrestling, of manager spots and manager 
you know, fucking tropes, as they say. The whole thing has been played for laughs from the start. And now on free television, they just put the manager in a handicap match. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody gives a shit about him to begin with. And they're not going to give a shit about this because it's booked with Tony Nese, who never wrestles on the program, uh, is his partner. It's underneath an underneath manager with an underneath guy wrestling a middle card guy. Why do it? Same thing as when you cake the fucking guy and nobody cares about the guy, the cake doesn't matter. Now it just becomes meaningless wrestling angles done for no reason and gets no re- returns on it. A hot man, I know this better than anybody. A hot manager in a match or in a handicap match or being forced to five minutes with the baby face if he wins, whatever the case, that can, under the right circumstances and has many times, draw more money than the world heavyweight champion defending against the number one challenger. Because it's a personal issue and they want to see it. They want to see the guy get his comeuppance. Nobody gives a shit whether Mark Sterling is burned at, at the fucking stake or, you know, given a fucking burial at sea. Because they don't care. They don't care about any of these people. So whatever happened here, I didn't care. And don't know. Did I miss anything? I missed this segment. I went to the kitchen. Good answer. Next, for the AEW women's title, Thunder Rosa defended against Miyu Yamashita. Even though we don't have to watch Twinkle Toes on TV while he's injured and out uh, rehabbing or, you know, getting well or whatever, his influence is still felt. Whoever Miyu Yamashita is, I got a feeling she's from the Outlaw Mud Show in Japan. Am I right about that? I don't know who she works for in Japan. I couldn't tell you. I bet you we do. Mud Show Central. And here's the thing. Thunder Rosa, she's got the face paint. She comes out with the cowboy hat. She's got fire. She's got oomph. She's got a personality. She looks like she's happy to be there or she's come to do something. She's got a mission. Is she she comes out like a goddamn a star or somebody who wants to be a star. And here we go with nameless Japanese outlaw girl number 74 that Harpo just can't get enough of. No facials, no personality, no body tone is not going to get over anywhere in this fucking country. No matter how hard Kenny and the rest of... What do they call the nerds in Japan? I've, I've seen on Twitter, they say he's a weeble. Or a... Is that what they... I have no idea. Is that what he's they a weeble it? or a... Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. He's a weeble or something. That's what Japanese nerds are that just... That are just nerds, right? They're already watching this program. If if you're a nerd, you're watching AEW, but there apparently ain't as many nerds as there used to be. Uh, if, if, this girl is not going to get over. Nobody's ever going to give a shit. She's not going to sell you a fucking ticket. She's not going to draw you 15 cents in Chinese money. If she was there to do a five-minute job for Thunder Rosa, the women's champion that can work and talk and has personality and people have heard of, that would have been fine. But they were out there trying to do Flair and Steamboat. And just, just no, just no. It ended up being two girls going through moves that you would look at as a practice match in wrestling school because even though Rosa is good and has experience or whatever, this girl, me, you, or you, me, or both of us, whichever one she was, is just as bland as a goddamn bleh, as a head of cabbage. That's it. So, again, they had to do Flair and Steamboat, and they went through a break, and coming back on the other side, I wrote, I swear to God, this Japanese convenience store clerk is kicking the shit out of Thunder Rosa. And and what good does that do? We're never going to see her again. If we do see her again, we won't remember. We saw her the first time, because this was very unremarkable. But what are they fucking doing? Just because Kenny Olivier raises these goofy 
untrained girls on pedestals. He refuses to the detriment of any talent that might be available over here that might actually get over and be able to speak to people. He's going to spend Tony's money to fucking fly unending, interchangeable, untrained, amateurish looking, blase, bland, boring girls from Japan. I wonder if he's flying them first class on Tony's dime. To go 20 minutes on TV with the fucking girl they're trying to get over as their champion. Just because Twinkle Toes gets a kick out of it. Jesus Christ. Comments on that match, if any. It was all right. I didn't really pay too close of attention to it. Yeah. I'm not as hard on the women coming from Japan just because they're coming from Japan like you are, but I agree with the sentiment that there's no I'm, reason. I'm hard on them because of the tour guide. Because the one, because <laughs> okay. here's well the thing: put. well, they're, put. they're they're not buying their own tickets. Somebody's bringing them over, and somebody's picking them. And uh, we know who that somebody is, and we know what we're going to get every time, and it's embarrassing. With that said, to your point, you're probably right. The little bits I saw, Thunder Rosa was kind of getting beat up, and I don't know if I'm ever going to see. Her opponent again, but Thunder Rose will be feuding with someone else next week on the show or whatever. You know, sometimes it's like almost like 1990 WCW after like Ole was the booker when just random things would show up on the Clash of the Champions and then like the guy would be gone and just people pop up and you, you can never feel like you can invest in anyone because there's just so many people and just people disappear all the time. I don't know how many people were invested in this match. Unless you just wanted to see a really good competitive match with the women's champion, but Thunder Rosa eventually Wait a minute, won. I agree it was competitive, but really good? Well, okay, I shouldn't have said really good if I said it there. That they was, uh... did all the moves. They just went through them in a blasé fashion with because Rosa was trying to help this girl get over in some... See that? They're all... All these modern-day wrestlers are raised to be so giving and so unselfish. And so friendly. That's why nobody gets over. And I'm sorry, but I guarantee you, in any of uh, any previous generation, not just a specific one, all of them, man, woman, or child, somebody comes over you've never heard of from fucking Japan, you got to go fucking 15 minutes on TV with them, and you're the champion of the company that is airing the television program? They're going to get a little offense. They ain't going to look great. Because it's your career you need to keep care of and take care of. Speaking of careers we need to take care of. <laughs> what's happened to Brian Danielson's? This was the capper. This was the capper. Daniel Garcia makes his entrance. He's announced at 187 pounds. And I think that's generous and in wrestling tights he looks like a ups driver on a day at the beach and he is wrestling brian danielson brian danielson's first match back from apparently uh, we uh, suspect he's had a concussion it's never actually been confirmed his first match back and they're risking him for 17 minutes on tv with an undercard stooge because tony khan now has found some affection for Daniel Garcia like he had before for pockets. So this match I knew going in would be good. This would be a good match regardless. It's Danielson, regardless of whether fucking Garcia was breathing or not, it'd be a good match and it would probably make sense. I said that the match itself didn't, didn't, little did I realize what the finish was going to be. But the only thing that didn't make sense was, why have this fucking thing? Again, you bring your biggest star back, one of your biggest names, one of, certainly one of the three biggest names in the company and possibly the best in-ring performer, fresh off a concussion and put him against an underneath guy that is, again, not going to be over until I'm fucking dead, not because I'm going to stop it, but because it's going to take at least 10 or 15 years. Instead of... Uh, 
So Danielson jump starts it and proceeds to kick the shit out of Garcia. And of course, we also have the dichotomy where Danielson was the best heel in the business back in December for about three weeks and then had to join the Blackpool Combat Club. And now he's a baby face, but he wrestles like a heel because the Blackpool Combat Club, thanks to Moxley, likes to drink blood and snap necks. But Garcia is an actual heel because he's affiliated with the sports entertainment heel group where Jericho is the boss and tries to do everything he can to get heat except when they play his music and then he wants all the fans to sing along with it. So naturally, Garcia is going to take over here and then pull the padding up off the floor. And then grab Danielson and throw him away from the bare floor that he's just exposed. And then Danielson makes a comeback on the floor and then throws him back in the ring and hits him with a missile drop kick. But Danielson sells the missile drop kick. And right at this point, I wrote Harley playing in her new bed is more entertaining. We got her a new bed. It's it's red and fluffy and and furry, and she loved burying herself in it. But then Danielson did the Shawn Michaels concussion collapse. And do you know there are still people that think that he really did collapse? No, really? That night on Raw, I've seen it on Twitter. And for the people who don't know, when Shawn Michaels got shit kicked out of him in, what was it, Syracuse or Rochester by the Marines? Or the Marine? Syracuse, I think. Syracuse. Okay, Michaels got shit kicked out of him, got a concussion by the Marine that he pissed off trying to hit on the Marine's girlfriend. And so he was off television, and they concocted the statement that it was nine Marines. It was actually one Marine, and Davy Boy was stuck in the back seat of the two-door car and couldn't get out to save his ass. So then, after the concussion, and this was before shit stain started. This was not a shit stain idea. This was actually from Vince. I think it was it was late 1995. We were in Richmond, Virginia. And I remember the two things. Number one, I was so mortified because 1995 was a horrible year for the wrestling business. And we were in the Richmond Coliseum for a Monday Night Raw taping with what had to be only 2,000, 2,500 people in that building. The ring was at the end. And I'm thinking all the times I was here for Crockett, This fucking thing had 13,000 people in it, and now here we are. But nevertheless, and secondly, I managed Owen in a match against Shawn Michaels, and they did the deal where Shawn's wrestling and then suddenly gets dizzy and starts kind of, you know, woozing around and collapses over to the side, and they're talking, it's the concussions, and me and Owen were supposed to, oh, shit, what's going on here? Oh, my God, we don't know what to do. And somehow that was going to, I didn't understand how it was going to help Sean at that time to remind people that he got the shit kicked out of him by the Marines. But nevertheless, they did the Sean Michaels thing here. Danielson has had a concussion, so he gets dizzy and collapses. The difference in the two television programs handling of this incident is when Sean collapsed, Me and Owen looked mortified, and so did the referee, and they got people at ringside to come in and tend to him and called medical personnel. And as I recall, we spent several minutes worried about Sean before we went off the air. The match did not continue. In this case, (laughs) the guy that had the concussion, the guy that also retired from wrestling because of multiple concussions and the after effects from aforesaid concussions collapses from a concussion he's recently had and then the heel <laughs> threw him in head first into the steel stairs and then DDT'd him on the exposed concrete floor for a break spot not the finish not a hospitalization angle that was the break spot So when we come back, Danielson was bleeding. Of course, Moxley did it first in the same program, but now the guy who could be, his career could be ended with one more concussion has been, has collapsed, then run headfirst in the steel stairs, then DDT'd on the concrete floor. 
But two minutes after they come back from the break, he's giving the heel a belly-to-back suplex off the top rope. Then they started going back and forth. Multiple false finishes. Danielson goes for the LaBelle lock. Garcia escapes. Danielson hits his knee on the floor. And as he's rolling back into the ring after he's thrown Garcia back in, a hand from under the ring grabs Danielson's leg. And he turns around to pull loose from that. And when he turns back around, Garcia hits him with a pile driver. The concussed man with a history of concussions that retired once from concussions and then was collapsed and then ran headfirst in the steel stairs and then DDT'd on a concrete floor. And then two minutes later, who was coming back and executing offensive moves, now is hit by a pile driver and dropped on his head head first. But that's not the finish because then Garcia rolls into the sharpshooter and they actually have Brian Danielson tap out to Daniel Garcia. Couldn't even beat him with the pile driver. And by the way, it was Jake Hager under the ring with the hand that reached out and grabbed him. Because he, he's another appreciator we hadn't seen at that point yet that night. And immediately my DVR froze because they, they can't manage their time. And again, they were massively almost out of time. What have they done here? You know what? I liked Daniel Garcia when we first started seeing him. I'm sick of him now. And now I resent him. Yes, <laughs> I hate to say yes, it that way. but It's, it's, it's full-fledged hatred now. I hate the way Brian Danielson has been used. I hate the way he's been used since they put him with Moxley. Let's not forget, he got concussed in that garbage match where he got pinned by Jericho to finish the match. Yes. That was the and last match. In a, in a garbage match that he shouldn't have been in to begin with because he's talented. He doesn't need to just do the shit that everybody can do. And so he, he had to retire once before because concussions. Then he trains himself, he comes back, and he dignifies this goddamn upstart fucking popsicle stand of a wrestling promotion with his presence, starts doing the best work of anybody in this company and maybe uh, some of the best stuff Brian's ever done, and immediately gets thrown into a goddamn group circle jerk with Plumber Moxley and his ilk. And now gets another concussion doing a garbage match trying to fucking work with Jericho's clown show and comes back and is tapped out by Daniel Garcia. And they and they and along that line, they risk him getting another concussion to do the stupid shit leading up to him getting beat. Can you imagine if Ricky Starks had been the one to tap out Brian Danielson? How about a Jay Lethal? How about a Powerhouse Hobbs? How about any motherfucker? Miro! Any motherfucker you might be able to sell it one ticket with or draw an ounce of money with or just have a fucking good match with. I agree with all those names except Jay Lethal, yes. I... I, I... <sighs> I mean, I know poor Jay now, everybody's like, well, they were excited when he came. I was. When he first got there, I was like, thank God. Now they've minimized him to the point where who gives a shit? And if, if I know a lot of people are saying, oh shit, we got to see Jay Lethal. That means we're going to see the big pinhead. So that's another reason I want to see Jay. But Jay is a, a, a talented fucking performer that could do a lot more than what they're allowing him to do while they show all the people that are going to suck Jericho's dick or fucking kiss Tony Khan's ass or, you know, wear a Halloween costume that one or both of them can dress up like. Well, again, you and I will disagree on lethal, but I'll say this. If in 92, early 93, if the WCW fans had in any way reacted in a positive way to Eric Watts, that kind of would have been the way Daniel Garcia and Wheeler Yuta have been used on this show. 
Yeah. For me. And again, that's the difference. Eric Watts had no fans. These guys do have fans. There are people there who like them. But I also think there's a lot of people like me that are like, God, I'm sick of these guys. Athletic. Potential for the future when they gain some weight or something. Sure. But nonstop. But see, that's, that's the thing. Tony gets the opportunity to have money drawing talent on his show there in front of him, and he can't recognize them. He either likes the kind of wrestler or goes on the recommendation of his brain trust for the kind of wrestler that is an indie darling for sure. All the people going to a rec center, all 500 of them would chant fight forever at these guys. But if you want to run a fucking real wrestling company, you need guys with personalities and charisma and size and a look and that can talk and that can work and have some experience in getting themselves over and or the ability to do same if given the opportunity. You don't need bland, boring, identically sized, identically personality, a.k.a. none, fucking technical wrestlers that, you know, have stolen their world of sports spots off of watching Colt Cabana tapes. That's what you don't need, and that's what they get, because it's like when Laurinaitis was in charge of talent relations in the mid-2000s, he signed people just like him, the Mark Jindrax of the world, tall, nondescript, no body, no promo ability, two left feet in the ring. Tony is, I, he's not hiring people like himself, but he's hiring people like his EVP choices. Gymnasts, trampoline cowboys, no personality, can't take them seriously, not physically intimidating, big bunch of pussies, and it's it's a goddamn children's clown show. He has people there, and he won't use them because they don't they don't fit what he is looking for. They're, it's it's a roster of twinks, not a roster of goddamn wrestlers. Can I ask you a question to play devil's advocate? Sure. Tony Khan has a young guy. Let's use Daniel Garcia for this example, but Wheeler Yuta is the exact same thing almost, except he's a baby face. He's putting him over. He's getting him on TV every week. While guys like Miro or Sting and Darby are not on the show every week, these guys are. They're getting promo time. He's putting them over big stars like Brian Danielson. Again, devil's advocate. Why isn't Tony doing it right? when it comes to getting these guys on TV and getting them over. Well, is he being advised not to do it right because his EVPs think that some of these people might get over them? Or is it just that they're so fucking stupid? Let's face it, none of these guys, they not only don't know anything about the wrestling business, I'm talking about the Cucamonga kids and Harpo and their ilk. They not only don't know anything about the wrestling business, they think that they've revolutionized it and you shouldn't do the shit that was always done because that's somehow wrong now. And instead we should have 30 minute matches where we fight on the floor for 20 minutes of it and do the flips and entertain everybody with our goddamn callbacks to famous Japanese spots of 1974. No, I don't think they, I, you know, I don't think there's any respect for Japanese wrestling from that era, actually, from, from oh, the well, people I, you're okay, accusing. Actually, call yeah. back more like from 2004. That's what they think is the good era of Japanese wrestling. The point is, that's what they do. This They don't know anything about the business they're in to begin with, and they don't try to learn because they think they've somehow improved it for the better. They genuinely believe that wrestling is better now than it was 20 years ago before before we got in it and showed people the way, you know, and, and, and as long as people believe something that's that fucking far out of goddamn bounds of reality, they're not going to learn anything and they're not going to teach any of these young kids anything. And they're not going to teach Tony anything because Tony is still one of the most inexperienced people involved. So he's not going to learn anything because they're not going to teach him anything. And the veterans that do, no, 
if they're not afraid of, you know, getting heat and losing their job more than actually being on a good program, they say that, but they don't get listened to. Remember, I always said JR when he did the tweet about, yeah, all of you just cluster up like quail and fucking wait for somebody to land on you. If he tweeted that in public, he'd said it five times at least in front of fucking people who didn't listen to it in private. So that's, I mean, you know, who's going to fucking, who's going to correct any of this? The people that Tony's listening to think that this is a good product and that wrestling is in a better place now than it was 20 years ago. So they're hopeless. Other people that might know better don't want to get heat and lose their job because they value their job more than their self-respect or pride, apparently. And there's very few people that can do this shit to begin with anymore. So it is what it is, but uh, it just, it, when shit's right in front of them and they, they turn left every time. It's amazing. So yeah, you can put that one down in the record books, folks. Daniel Garcia tapped out Brian Danielson on free television and didn't, and didn't get over a goddamn inch more than he was beforehand because it was all in the middle of a bunch of hoo-ha that couldn't register because none of it made sense and it all came at you too fast. When you see the last several months and we saw the CM Punk year before he got hurt and we assume that CM Punk was rather assertive in what he would do and what he wouldn't do and who he would work with and who he wouldn't work with, when you see how Brian Danielson's been used, do you think... It would be a situation where he's making these decisions or he's no. less assertive than CM Punk and he's talked into these things. He's not coming up with this shit from scratch on his own. He's agreeing to it because he's a nice guy and he wants to help everybody. And I think Brian probably thinks that Daniel Garcia and Wheeler, Yuta and all the rest of these fucking indie guys, well, they, they're, they're really talented. They just need an opportunity because he, he looks at the glass half full. I look at the glass like it's all the way empty because the crack in the bottom where everything drained out and we're going to have to replace the whole goddamn thing. And what I'm saying is, I don't care if Frank Gotch comes back to fucking life and puts these guys over. They don't have the personality, the size, the look, the physical charisma, and they're not getting the mental education about wrestling that they need, all those things that they need to actually get over. Whereas a guy like Starks and a guy like Hobbs, and again, maybe we'll go through the whole roster next week and see, okay, can they field a legitimate team for a legitimate promotion, or do they have a few talented standouts and it's mostly all outlaw bullshit? But they, at least for a territory, maybe not a national promotion, but for a territory, 20 guys, they could probably field a really good team as far as putting together a talent roster for a territory, there's got to be 20 guys there that, that know what the fuck they're doing or could be taught. But past that, it's just bleh. And I don't, you said we saw the year of punk. We saw Danielson at Christmas time. MJF was brilliant. And I thought this summer, even without before we knew that all the things that were going to go on in the WWE and, and how they were going to be in turmoil and et cetera, I thought this is going to be a bit of a dogfight this summer. You know, they're, they're going to have some and Cody going to the WWF. There's going to be some good shit going on. Now there's no Cody. Reigns is part-time. Brock's part-time. Fucking Punk is hurt. MJF is whatever the fuck's going on there. And the AEW program nearing their third anniversary is worse than ever. And it's like Tony's learning in reverse. It's like he books in reverse and he learns in reverse. He was booking more logically when he was a complete amateur than he is now that he's got three years of experience. Just like talent comes into the company and you see them every once in a while on TV doing a job. And then after they've been there six months, they start popping up every week and winning. Everything's a mirror image. It's like the bizarro world. But not Canada. Even worse. 
Well, we'll see <sighs> how much worse it gets this week on AEW Dynamite. I can't believe the booking of Brian Danielson. That's, you know, I could find, because it was so puzzling and I can get a kick out of some of the bad things, as you know, but there was also good elements in the Ricky Starks escapade segment or two, whatever that was. And then yeah. the Christian Jungle Boy thing. Okay. Not the way we would have done it, but almost close to a traditional wrestling feud in terms of there being a good guy and a bad guy. But the booking of Danielson, that's the most puzzling thing of all. And see, that's the thing. He's not going to be a prick like Punk. And, and Punk would be proud of being a prick about his business or standing up for himself. Brian Danielson is a nicer guy and his he loves wrestling and he loves all the young the young bright-eyed innocent young people that want to be involved in wrestling and he wants to help them. Well, the way that he could help most is by getting and keeping himself over despite his amateur booker and the people that are probably trying to stab him in the back and produce revenue for the company. That would be the best thing he could do right now for all the young wrestlers instead of going in and working with them for 20 minutes and putting them over when nobody's going to buy it anyway. And next year, if somebody remembers that Daniel Garcia beat Brian Danielson, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised in six months. And in terms of whether it means anything for Daniel Garcia, no, he's same level now he was before to the overall scheme of things. The the AEW fans that they already had may like him a little more than they already did, but otherwise, pretty, you need to do the right thing with the right guy. One or the other alone doesn't work. This was neither the right thing nor the right guy. And how impressive is Wheeler Yuta? He beat Daniel Garcia at the Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Well, there you go. And then it's... <laughs> so by that standpoint, Anna Jay ought to be slapping Danielson around next week. Now, I would pay to watch that match. <laughs> All right. All right, I'd pay to... And, and here's another thing. By gum, I forgot I'm mad at you because you made me listen to that whole goddamn media scrum the other day. So... You just watch your P's and Q's there, pal, fella. You know, I have no defense. I apologize. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to be back with something else you're making me watch. Uh, on your program, we're going to talk about SummerSlam. That's going to be, as we mentioned, it's going to be on the YouTube channel, at least as we're as much as possible. And then it's going to be in the podcast. So you'll hear it one place or another. But we're trying to... We're trying to get this out as quickly as possible with our screwy schedule around construction, et cetera. But SummerSlam is next. They're supposed to make a big creative splash. What kind of splash are they going to make? Jeff Jarrett's going to be the new challenger to Brock Lesnar. All right. Well, anyway, enough of this for now. We're going to watch something else we don't particularly want to watch in SummerSlam. Uh, at your behest, but we will have that on your program, The drive Through. We're going to plug it into the official YouTube channel uh, first, if we can, so people get their their fix of corny on SummerSlam, and then it'll be in the drive Through. We'll have other exciting topics, and as well, there's something else. Oh, and, and, and we're going to do, we need to sit down and look at the AEW roster. So either on the drive Through or next week on the experience, we got to do that too, and see if we could weed out that thing to where it would be, uh, you know, an acceptable roster that you could actually do something with if it was assembled with some element of thought and planning, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We've been teasing it. You've been promising it for probably a year and a half now. Well, it keeps changing. They keep kicking people out over on the other side and then the, Tony keeps picking them up. And now what we hear, Adam Cole signed for five, Malachi Black, they said, is signed for five years. Jesus Christ, I hope he's a good landscaper. They're going to have a problem finding something for him to do for five fucking years. He's anyway. All right. We're going to do all that on your show and coming up in the future episodes of the experience. Correct? And questions and questions from and listeners. questions such as why are you still watching this shit? What the hell's the matter with you? Those questions. We get those all the time. In the meantime, 
Until then, everybody, thank you for bearing with us today. Have an enjoyable weekend. Thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.